go ahead and get get started and we'll work through things as uh, as we progress. This is a lot of people to bring together this morning. Um, I believe that we have, uh, there may be someone that's running Harmony in their backgrounds. So let's all make sure that we're on uh, mute. And I don't know if it makes a difference staff or not, but it appears that the conferee mic might also be on and that will pick up every single noise in that uh, room when we don't want it to be. So you might want to take and check that mic. I want to welcome everyone uh, normally in a round table format. I like to go around and, and have everyone uh, introduce themselves and uh, in the uh, issue of time that we've got today, we're going to kind of forego that. I think we'll have plenty of time to get to know each other as we progress through this process. Uh, so I welcome everyone this morning. So let's all make sure that we're on that uh, mute. And I don't know if it makes a different staff or not, but it appears that the conferee mic might also be on and that will pick up every single noise in that uh, room when we don't want it to be. So you might want to take and check that mic. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, normally in a round table format, I like to go around and, and have everyone uh, introduce them uh, in the uh, issue of time that we've got today. We're going to kind of front throw that. I think we'll have plenty of time to get to know each other as we progress through this process. Okay, apparently we're dealing with a delay because you probably noticed that at uh, one point here I was not moving my lips but I was talking so I'm not quite sure what that feedback is. Um, we appreciate everyone uh, participating in this, our legislators as well as our non-legislators who have uh, taken time out of their, their precious schedules. But we felt that it was important, our leadership felt it was important that we have uh, experience from all over the Kansas that deal with the mental health system that we currently have. Um, the uh, legislators, we have been allowed six days in order for our, our committee to meet as far as being paid. Non-legislators will meet uh, for six days with, in, a, in separate work groups, and we'll be talking about that later today. And we'll be working with the Kansas Health Institute. You will hear us refer to them as KHI. We do our foreign language in the, the state capital is acronyms. Uh, Legislators are requested to attend those work group meetings at, uh, if you would allow us to partake of your time at uh, no reimbursement rate so that we have input from not only our experts, but also the legislators to uh, be able to come back together and hopefully we can come in with some uh, legislation for this upcoming session in 2021. All those meetings with KHI will be done via Zoom. Our mission and our goal is to um, look at our mental health services across Kansas in our communities and what are we doing today, what should we be doing, and how do we address things in the future. We're going to try to uh, shoot for the moon on this. We're going to attempt to put together a 10-year mental health plan and lay out the phases as well as the expense that goes along with that. We know that across Kansas and even in our own communities, and, and we've experienced that, is that you know, we're pretty much fragmented. We have a lot of people doing a lot of things, but if we were to able to kind of coordinate a little bit more, we may be able to not only maximize our services because we also know that we have a workforce shortage in the area of uh, mental health providers, but to also be able to maximize um, all of those that are working in this field to maximize their dollars as well. In other words, like I said earlier, we're going to shoot for the moon and we foresee this being a long-term commitment over the next five months. Our last meeting will be held in December. We have not laid those dates out as of yet. There will be four more meetings after today and tomorrow where the uh, legislators will be allowed to be reimbursed. And 
uh, KHI, as I said, will be facilitating the meetings with our non-members into three separate work groups. So I just want to welcome everybody. Thank everyone for giving their time, but I, it also it shows your commitment to this process. It shows your commitment to the issue. And we know that now more than ever, we truly need to address our I, you know, I refer to it more often as behavioral services because we also know that it's not just the mental, mental health side of it that many times there includes a substance abuse side to this as well. And I think with what everyone has participated in in the, uh, the new world that we're living in right now, the norm is really stressing a whole lot of folks out there. So I'm going to start off with our uh, agenda this morning on the informational briefing on the Governor's Substance Use T uh, Disorder Task Force, and that's going to be presented by Karen Brayman, Senior Vice President of Healthcare Strategy and Policy, Kansas Hospital Association. Well, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony regarding the Kansas Hospital Association's participation in Governor Collier's task force to address substance use disorders. KHA was very appreciative of the opportunity to participate as one of almost 30 members of the task force that was created by executive order of Governor Collier on March 1st of 2018. The task force duties as established in the executive order were to gather information about substance use disorder within Kansas, particularly regarding the growing number of opioid and heroin overdoses in Kansas, as well as uh, the continued scourge of methamphetamine addiction, to evaluate and leverage existing resources, uh, especially those that had already been established in Kansas, um, notably the work of the Kansas Prescription Drug and Opioid Advisory Committee to investigate various response options, including distributing naloxone to first responders and more comprehensively utilizing the KTRAX prescription drug monitoring data and uh, otherwise revising state health policy as appropriate uh, to examine best practices for the prevention, treatment and recovery of at-risk individuals, to advise and make recommendations to the governor and to assist in implementing and executing on a statewide response to substance use disorders. Um, the task force met about monthly between April and August of 2018. It was chaired by Dr. Greg Lakin, who at the time was a chief medical officer for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And the task force was supported by staff from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and DECA as well as uh, the Kansas Health Institute or KHI, as you mentioned earlier, uh, who provided facilitation of the task force, research support and report preparation. Our meetings focused on five primary topics as defined by the Prescription Drug and Opioid Advisory Committee. That's a statewide committee that's uh, been meeting for a number of years and also has a strategic plan um, it's posted on KDHE's website. That strategic plan is referred to as the Kansas Prescription Drug and Opioid Misuse and Overdose Strategic Plan. Um, these topics I mentioned a little bit earlier included provider education, prevention, treatment and recovery, law enforcement, and neonatal abstinence syndrome. According to the final report, there were about 86 individuals and organizations who submitted testimony to inform the task force. The final report, and as I understand, the committee will be reviewing these recommendations uh, later in this committee meeting today, but that final report included a list of 34 priority recommendations of the task force spanning those five focus areas I mentioned. And the task force report, as well as meeting minutes, public comments, and other supporting materials are available on KDHE's website at preventoverdoseks.org. I'll stop here. I appreciate the opportunity to provide uh, information about KJ's participation in the task force. And uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity this morning and I'm 
happy to take any questions. Is there anyone that has a, a question for Karen? All right, thank you very much. I appreciate you doing this this morning and we can make sure that people have uh, access to a copy of that, of the full report. Thank you, thank Madam you. Chair, members of the committee. Okay, next we have a uh, informational briefing on the uh, Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council. Wes Cole, Chairman of the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council. Welcome to committee. Is Wes here? Wes isn't with us, staff. Yeah, Wes is here. Okay. I'm trying to, I guess it's in Zoom, it's no longer in the other one, is that correct? I think so. Legislature.zoom.us. Well, and if Wes just wants to give his report, that's fine as well. Can we? Can, can everybody hear me? Hello? I can. I can. Okay. I, I, I'm having a little problem here with technology. I would just say go ahead, Wes, with what you've got. Okay, well, again, can can folks hear me? I can. Yes. I believe they can, Wes. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and start, and, and uh, maybe we'll get something worked out. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I want to thank the chair, and I also want to thank the committee for having this opportunity to be involved in this process and uh, informing people of what the council does and how important it is in behavioral health in the state of Kansas. I did send out a copy earlier as to the duties of the membership. Uh, the council is... is uh, is created by uh, federal regulation and also a state statute. And the re responsibilities are to review the block grant that we submit from the state and to make recommendations to serve as an advocate for adults with serious mental illness, children with a serious emotional disturbance and other individuals with mental illnesses or substance use disorders to review, monitor and evaluate 
not less than each year the allocation and adequacy of services within that state. You look at those three duties and those three duties are a lot of work uh, for a council made up of 34 members. Uh, of, of 34 members. Uh, in order to accomplish the work and get done what we need to get done in the state of Kansas, we have created a number of subcommittees to uh, advise uh, the, the council. Because what we have to be looking at, we have to look at mental health. We have on our council, we have education, rehabilitation, criminal justice, housing, social services, and state Medicaid and substance use. In order to accomplish that, we have established uh, eight subcommittees. One is a children's subcommittee. One is a housing and homeless subcommittee. One is a justice involved youth and adult subcommittee. The Kansas Citizens Committee on Alcohol and J Drug Abuse Prevention Subcommittee. Rural and Frontier Subcommittee. Veteran Subcommittee. Vocational Subcommittee. And we also have tribal representation. These subcommittees are made up of people all across the state. And, uh, and they do a fantastic amount of work. Uh, we have break, broken things down in the state by, by the populations we serve in the state. Uh, you have the, the uh, urban areas. They make up about eight counties in the state. Semi-urban, that's another six counties. 21 counties are rural, and the rest are frontier counties. They all don't fit the same shoe. So we have to have diversity across our state and make sure that people are, have input into the block grants and how money is spent within the state. And that is how we do that. Um, um, each one of those subcommittees put together an annual report uh, and we present those to the secretary, the deputy secretary and the commissioner. Uh, we also present those reports like with the justice-involved youth and adults, we'll have that commissioner from corrections because corrections has people on the, the um, justice-involved uh, youth and adult subcommittee. There are major goals that each subcommittee has, uh, and that is to assure consumer and family youth involvement. Our council has to be made up of at least 51% consumers and family members. We have 62%, and I think it's a little more, really. Develop and maintain a, an effective workforce where we work in the rural and frontier areas. Those subcommittees are working with different community folks, mental health centers. We're pulling the whole group together. It's so important to get everybody working together. Uh, another big issue, especially in the, in the um, um, rural and frontier areas, is, is uh, disparity. And when you look at the resources we have in the state, we have more research resources in the semi-urban and the urban. So, so we take a really close look and see what we can do there. We expand evidence-based practices within those subcommittees. Those subcommittees have the authority uh, to uh, ask for um, technical assistance. And we do provide technical assistance. And prime example is the veteran subcommittee. That subcommittee came about because uh, we were having problems with family members and people being mobilized in the state of Kansas. We directly want to work with those families, and we do, and they've done a fantastic job in that area. Uh, improving access to services, that means you're going to be working with everybody, the private sector, you're going to be working with the mental health centers, and, and we have different work groups that are working on that. And integrating mental health and substance use with primary help health. That is a new addition that, that we've, we've added to it, and we are looking very much at, at, at that uh, integration and promote early intervention and prevention across the lifespan, and that's very important. Maximize health and wellness and uh, offer public awareness and education, and, and, and the subcommittees are doing that also. These subcommittees are all volunteer people, and they come from different, different aspects of uh, of the profession uh, because we want that integration on those subcommittees with the consumer and, and family uh, uh, involvement because those recommendations are very, very important. Um, 
an example like with the rule and frontier. The rule and frontier, uh, yes, they have goals and they have jet objectives and, and, and they do present those to the council and they present their reports to the secretaries, which is, which, which is very important. But they're also working with USDA and they're also developing uh, uh, effective workforce plans. And they're working with universities, they're working with uh, Wichita State University, they're working with different groups. People are working all the time. People. In order to have these subcommittees to be effective, they've got to be working together. And uh, integration, and I am so glad to hear that from the chair, integration is one of the major keys that we need to be looking at in the state of Kansas to bring the family together. One of the big goals of the council is going to be as soon as the coronavirus and stuff is settles down, we are going to bring the family together within the state of Kansas. That's everybody everybody. And we're going to look at lessons learned. What did we learn from this? What went well? What didn't go well? Who was left out? Uh, we're going to look at the entire thing. We're going to put together uh, all of that information. And the time to do it is as quickly as we can once this thing settles down, because everybody's been doing it. So we're going to be working in, in that direction. Uh, we work very close with KDADS. KDADS, uh, is really a major strength of the council uh, in that they offer a, a, a liaison to each one of these subcommittees to make sure that these subcommittees have uh, uh, logistics support. Also access to the website, the council website on, on KDAD's website. Uh, those liaisons also are communicating back and forth with those subcommittees. There may be something that the secretary, deputy secretary, the um, commissioner would like to see, and uh, and they communicate that information to that subcommittee and, and the council, and, and we will take a look at it. Also, in the process of working together, uh, the council also has set up and works very close with KDADS in the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council Grant Advisory and Review Board. And the purpose of that is, is to review grants and, and things that come into the state of Kansas through SAMHSA, especially the block grant and the substance use grant, but we get other grants. At the same time, they can provide that oversight with those subcommittees, like with the Children's Subcommittee uh, Systems of Care. They can provide the, the, the oversight of that grant, which is it's very good. Now, there's another prime example. You've got a children's subcommittee made up of a, uh, a large group of people, family members and, uh, and consumers, and, and they're concerned about family issues. But we not, we, we not only make recommendations there, but we, we, we partner with other organizations with the state, like education. One of the things that we uh, uh, had that we saw that we thought we needed to address. We worked with the Department of Education and came up with a manual on school mental health. And that was a coordinated effort between everybody, which really benefited lots of folks. We had a disaster out here in Western Kansas where a county burned up. Uh, the subcommittee, Keys for Networking, Mental Health Centers, the school district, we all got together. We sent a group of people out there to assist those school children, to listen to the school children, but at the same time, we learned a big lesson here because of what the work the subcommittee and, and what KDADS was doing. And that was that uh, we had a lot of grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles uh, trying to raise kids. And when you, it was wonderful talking to those kids because those kids needed to talk to somebody else about watching their animals burn up and what it meant to them. You know, everybody at home was depressed, but we were new ears. But the thing is, uh, in talking to these grandparents and these aunts and uncles and friends that were trying to keep kids out of foster care, they just needed somebody to talk to and more information. And so we were really, we were able to take that information back to Topeka and back to DCF. And, and we had names and stuff, and we were able to see that these people got attention, and that's important especially in the, in the frontier areas, uh, people don't like to complain and they don't like to, they just won't, they just don't know how and they just, they just don't like to complain. Well, at least 
we're doing a lot of work with that subcommittee, but we just had the year before last, and and I'm, I've got to tell you all about this. The year before last, we had SAMHSA came to the state of Kansas. We sent them a bunch of information on what the council was doing and what the council has done, the recommendations and the information from the council. Every bit of that information that we sent had been read by that group. Instead of two days here in Kansas, they were here for three days. They went to some subcommittee meetings and they were just absolutely, totally surprised and impressed what was going on. When they left, they said that Kansas was one of the best, in their estimation, the best council and the best system that they had seen. Uh, they're the ones that recommended and, and talked to us about the integrating uh, uh, mental health and substance use and, and physical health. So, and, and we've implemented that. But now Kansas is also helping other states with their councils um, to pick up on what we're doing in the state of Kansas. That's a high honor for the state of Kansas. When you look at all the states, when I go to Washington, D.C., and we got we got uh, councils from every state, every, um, every all our territories, everybody is there. The first people they want to hear from is what's the council doing in the state of Kansas. So basically, that is the council. There's a a lot more to that and what we're doing. Uh, we do get involved in grants by working with the mental health centers and stuff like that, identifying and supporting those initiatives. So uh, I just, um, basically that's the council and uh, how we work very close uh, with other agencies within the state. We also, like I said, we have tribal uh, representation on the council and uh, that's been a little challenging, but uh, we're really moving forward on that also. So, any questions? Are there questions for Wes? Madam Chair, this is Representative Shu. I have a question. Yes. yes. Uh, Wes, you mentioned, thank you for being here. Uh, thank, uh, you mentioned that many kids were being raised by their grandparents. Um, yes. Did you, in those conversations, did you run into any issues about statutes being in the way uh, or making life harder for these grandparents raising children? No, not really. We, we No, we did. I, I don't ever remember anything like that being stated. Basically, what they were asking for is that we just need somebody to talk to. We need somebody to talk to. We need some, some way to go. Now, let me tell you what. When you're dealing with um, there's a lot of thought about services in the community and stuff like that. But when you talk about the frontier areas, and uh, and I used to be superintendent of Sawatomi State Hospital, and I'd get calls from people saying, hey, I want to voluntarily come to the hospital because, you know, I, I don't want to go to the local mental health center and stuff like that, because if I drive there, they'll see my car and I'll be ostracized from the, the community. So there's just... There, there's those things that you have to deal with, and um, uh, it, it, they just there. There needs to be more education. The subcommittee has done a tremendous amount of work of that. When when you look at the makeup of that subcommittee, and uh, they have a legislative day, and and uh, um, we have the legislators there. We have people all across uh, Western Kansas come to those meetings. And we give a uh, of the bar it's a barbecue we have a, a dinner a lunch for these folk, folks in fact you you look at the prevention subcommittee and the uh, children's subcommittee uh, we even had a, a, a session at when the legislature started uh, we learned a lot from that there was a lot of interest but there was too much going on but we're going to continue to do it but we're going to do it a little differently uh, but the the main thing and what the chair said is exactly right the issue, if you really want to modernize the system, bring the system together. And if you bring the system together and people are working together, then you tear down those barriers. Uh, we've done a lot of work. We've got a lot of people from um, uh, the universities, uh, KU. We work with folks there and what they're setting up. We work with, with Wichita State. That's a wonderful a group to work with out there. They do a fantastic job, especially in the area of prevention. And um, and I, I just, you know, 
it's it's Kansas is right on target. But the thing is, we have a big opportunity to make it much better. Further questions? Um, okay, I couldn't hear who that was. This is Representative Barnberger. Um, I have a question for Wes. I know in Western Kansas, we do not have a, um, well, Florida State Hospital closing their unit for kids, and then it went to KBC and Hayes, and they moved down to Wichita. We don't have a place for um, our kids to go. Who are dealing with mental health situations like this um, in Western Kansas? So my advice is, has your committee, have you guys discussed how we could possibly get another one out there? Um, I was a senator from Western Kansas and an advocate for Western Kansas. We were talking about that. Just one yeah. second. One of the things I will ask committee members to do is get those mics in there are not awesome. So please get closer to the mic because I had a hard time hearing your questions. But go ahead, Wes. And I really didn't hear the question. I mean, I, I, I couldn't tell what the question was. I'm as close as I can possibly get. Do you want me to yell into the mic? I can do that. Um, what, raise, what, yeah, raise, you're going to have to raise your voice or something. Or maybe whoever's direct with me can repeat the question. Okay, my question is... I feel weird yelling. Um, it has to deal with Warner State Hospital with since they put their unit for kids and um, so did KBC out in Hayes. My question is where are we are we gonna have some has your task force talked about how we can possibly get more um, beds or another unit out in here out in Western Kansas uh, for our kiddos that have to deal with mental health? Uh, this is Andy Brown. I'm the Commissioner for Behavioral Health Services. And um, if it's possible, could I answer that question for Wes? Yes. Okay. So um, at the end of the legislative session um, last year, we were appropriated funds for building a new hospital in Hayes, Kansas. Um, and our intention is to RFP that this fall and hopefully have progress being made on renovations on a facility in Hayes um, by the beginning of next year. So that's kind of where we're at currently in that process. Um, we do recognize that there is a desperate need for um, children's psychiatric inpatient facilities in Western Kansas. Um, and we are working on trying to uh, respond to that need. Well, and if I recall correctly, the, the uh, reason that that kind of happened out in Hayes is because you lost because of a change of the definition, I believe it was uh, beds for children and we were sending children to Colorado and Nebraska. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so that we did have a children's psychiatric unit that was part of a PRTF facility in Hayes um, that was closed. <laughs> the psychiatric hospital beds were closed um, by KVC in about uh, July of last year. Um, and they opened up a new hospital in Wichita, um, and so children were being um, sent to Wichita. Um, there are some hospitals in Colorado um, that serve some children on the western side of the state, um, but the majority, I think, were being diverted to the Wichita facility. All right, thank you. Are there further yeah. questions, Wes? Yeah, I, wa I want to add to that. The, the council was very much aware of, 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 of the issue that you brought up. Um, the subcommittee, the uh, Rural and Frontier subcommittee did address that issue. Um, I was at one of their meetings and, and these subcommittees meet every month and sometimes twice a month um, at one of their meetings here before the coronavirus. And that was a very big concern of theirs. Uh, the, new, the reports are coming in now from all the subcommittees. They'll be presented to the council uh, next month at, their, at the council meeting because we review them first. And then those reports will go uh, to the uh, secretary and, and commissioner and the deputy secretary. That item will be included in those recommendations because I know that was one of the things they were very concerned about. When we had the legislative dinner out there at Dodge City, 
uh, and that was before the coronavirus hit. Um, that uh, that was a big issue and a, and a major issue. And again, uh, uh, we need to really take a look. Uh, we we have some really concerns when you look at the frontier areas. You know, the Children's Subcommittee, one of the things that we found out, and, and this was through the um, um, Rural and Frontier Subcommittee, uh, Garden City, 50 languages in the school district, 50 different languages. And you look at some of the counties, how the county, the populations in those counties are, are changing. When we look at disparity and equity, uh, we're not really talk, we're, we're talking about the, the changes in the populations in those areas and, and the challenges that it creates for us. And so, and, and they're taking a look at that and they're looking at that very closely. Um, We'll, uh, those reports will be coming out here shortly, and uh, and I will talk to uh, uh, the chair out there at that with that subcommittee, which is Shauna Wright, University of Kansas Medical Center, and uh, and then the co-chair is Amanda, and that's for, and she's from St. Francis Ministries. So we'll, we'll I'll I'll bring your, your your question back up with them also. But again, look at that report that's going to be coming from the rural and frontier areas. So that, that's all I have. Are there any further questions for Wes? All right, seeing none, thank you very much, Wes. We appreciate you being with us here this morning. Next, we have an infor, uh, informational briefing on the Crossover Youth Working Group uh, presented by Randy Karlstrom, President and CEO of Wyandotte Behavioral Health Network. Welcome to committee. Whoever's talking, I cannot hear you. So, this is Senator Ridian. We did have a question, but uh, we can move on and ask that later. So. Madam Chair, would you like me to proceed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning um, to Madam Chair and members of the Mental Health Modernization and Reform Committee. Again, my name is Randy Kallstrom and I was a member of the second crossover youth working group. Um, there were two crossover youth working groups formed by DCF in response to a 2019 budget proviso mandating a study of the impact of Senate Bill 367. <laughs> The first group met in fiscal year 19, and the second group, which, which I was a part of and will be providing testimony on today, met from July of 2019 through January of 2020 with the task force studying the 16 data elements requested in the legislative budget proviso. For purposes of the working group, crossover youth were defined as youth at risk of being placed in foster care due in whole or in part due to conduct that has resulted or could result in the juvenile offender allegations and youth placed in foster care engaging in conduct that has resulted or could result in juvenile offender allegations. The workforce identified three primary pathways for crossover youth in Kansas being placed in child welfare. One, the youth is already in foster care and is arrested and adjudicated. Two, the youth is not in foster care, is arrested, and the family refuses to pick them up at the juvenile intake and assessment services. Three, the youth is not in foster care, but is involved in the juvenile justice system and is not complying with those uh, requirements. The working group studied and identified 691 crossover youth who were involved in the child welfare system and had some involvement with law enforcement or the juvenile justice system as of July 31 in 2019. Nearly 78% were 14 years of age or older, similar or like the general, popular, general offender population with over 42% of the crossover youth being female compared to only 22% of the broader juvenile offender population in Kansas. 
70% of the youth in the study were non-Hispanic white and nearly a quarter were non-Hispanic black with less than one in 10 in the study being Hispanic. The working group explored the impact of Senate Bill 367 at the point of law enforcement contact and in sentencing at court. Post SB 367, law enforcement officers have limited authority for decisions related to placement and detention with the detention risk assessment being the determining factor. Officers now have three primary options, take the youth back home, arrest the youth on criminal charges or serve a notice to appear or NTA to, for that juvenile to appear at juvenile intake. Judges must now follow a narrow criterion of the juvenile posing a significant risk of harm to others or damage to property for detention, or they must use sentencing alternatives. Danger to self was removed as a detention criterion under SB 367. In FY19, there were 1,194 placements outcomes following juvenile intake for these crossover youth with 25% resulting in a detention placement. Nearly 21% of the placements resulted in the juvenile being returned home to their parent or guardian. Some judges, judges excuse me, have expressed frustration that there are limited options for youth who are a risk to themselves by repeatedly running away, including the risk of child trafficking. Prior national studies have reported that crossover youth are associated with higher risk of mental health challenges, higher rates of recidivism, poor placement stability, and lower permanency outcomes. This was found to be true for crossover youth in Kansas as well. Based upon the Massachusetts Youth Screening Instrument, second version, or more commonly referred to as the MAZI-2, that is completed at the Juvenile Intake and Assessment Centers, 23% of crossover youth screened indicated elevated levels of anxiety or depression, and nearly two in 10 indicated a warning of suicidal ideation. Permanent or stable placements in the child welfare system are challenging for crossover youth. Twice as many crossover youth were placed in residential group homes as all other Kansas foster care youth, and only 10% of crossover youth were placed with a relative compared to nearly 30% of all foster care youth. No crossover youth received a pre-adoptive placement in FY19. Even more alarming, crossover youth had a placement stability rate of 26.1 compared to 9.7 for all Kansas youth, foster care youth. A placement stability rate is based on the rate of moves per 1,000 days spent in foster care. And less than 5% of crossover youth reached permanency in FY19. Several evidence-based outpatient or community treatment programs and services exist in Kansas for crossover youth. Functional Family Therapy or FT, General Parent Management Training Oregon or the PMTO model and a variety of programs based on cognitive behavioral therapy are just a few. In addition, the community mental health centers provide an array of mental health services for these youth ranging from outpatient therapy to intensive community-based wraparound services. In addition to outpatient and community-based services, 14.2% of crossover youth in FY19 received psychiatric residential treatment with an average length of stay being four and one half months. In closing, I would like to highlight some of the key findings of the working group. Consistent data collection and ability to share data across systems regarding crossover youth is needed. This was a significant barrier as the group looked at both the community corrections, um, the court system, foster care system, sharing data and common data point collections were limited. Contact with law enforcement is a very important entry point and additional alternatives to detention in the community are needed. Earlier treatment intervention and wraparound services are also needed, and parent-only sessions are not reimbursed under Medicaid. Placement instability is a significant barrier to these services being delivered, and the number of placement disruptions highlight the need for more therapeutic, 
specialized foster care homes across the Kansas. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and I invite any questions that the committee may have. Are there questions for Randall? Madam Chair, I have a question. Can Brenda hear that? Representative Landmark hear that? Who, who has that question? Identify yourself. Elizabeth Bishop. Okay. Go ahead, Representative Bishop. Somebody's got music going. Let's go, Barbara. <laughs> I I have a question regarding uh, the removal or uh, elimination of a category that was harm to self. Um, I understand that was part of um, the original proviso and I am just wondering if anybody knows why and is that a problem? What are you, re okay, I'm not quite following what you're referring to, Representative Bishop. Um, under SB 367, as they're looking at the, the various pathways, uh, as I understood it, one of the elements that was not allowed to be considered was potential harm to self. Now, maybe I misunderstood that, in which point I, I'd appreciate a clarification. Randall, do you have an answer? I, I, yes, I can answer that uh, to the extent that I'm able. Um, it's my understanding that self-harm was removed as an option for detention, because you really do not want to put a child, a juvenile, into jail essentially a juvenile detention facility locked up um, who is not criminal in nature. Um, that really isn't considered nationally to be best practice. Um, so if someone is a runaway, um, they're putting themselves in danger or if they're self-harming in a suicidal ideation, et cetera, um, youth used to be placed in or could be placed in detention. Um, and while that's not best practice and actually Research and literature shows that that can be harmful to juveniles. There are not alternatives um, currently in, in the continuum for judges um, to detain that individual in a safe place. So it's kind of like it's either jail or juvenile detention rather and in a community placement and there's really nothing in between. So the result is that there have been a number of uh, young juveniles who continue, have continued to run away, putting themselves at risk, um, who um, aren't otherwise able to be detained. Uh, Madam Chair, may I comment? Yes. I appreciate that clarification and that looks to me to be a, a serious void that we do need to address. Um, I know that these statistics relative to suicide have been increasing and also among youth. And uh, it sounds like there's a definite gap there that we need to, <clears throat> excuse me, please, that we need to address. The working group findings would uh, affirm what you just said. Thank you. Are there, 
Are there further questions? I don't know. <coughs> I believe <coughs> our, <coughs> our Senator Petty may have had a question. Yes, Madam Chair, I have a uh, question for Randy. Uh, Randy, you mentioned in your list that you provided for us about uh, being able to, uh, for data collection and ability to share. And I would just like if you could expand on that from a legislative perspective. Um, is this because of, of restrictions in legislation concerning data? Were you able to hear that, Randy? Yeah. Randall. I so um, my understanding, Senator, is that the restrictions are based on privacy laws um, and the appropriate releases of information or business associate agreements, whatever mechanisms would need to be in place to um, share data. But it was also a technical um, challenge as well with different systems having different uh, software programs, et cetera, that are unable to talk to each other. So just to, to, uh, to clarify for that, so it's not due to any legislative restrictions that we have put in place, but it's, um, but it's more of a, a, a software problem? Well, it's the inability of different software programs being able to speak to each other, but there were also, um, as I understood it at least, from people in corrections, the court service officers, et cetera, child welfare, um, some restrictions around privacy issues and the ability to share specific case information or, or protected health information um, at, at a systems level and, uh, and having the proper legal releases in place. Um, I'm a, that is, the specifics around that, I, I really am not able to speak to, and I'm not sure what the legislature might be able to do to help address that. Um, but that was something that was discussed at considerable length during the working group. Uh, thank you. And Madam Chair, I have a second question. Uh, you mentioned about that parents uh, only sessions are not reimbursed through Medicaid. And is that something that that could be uh, applied as a, for a waiver at the state level? Uh, this is a point um, that would be extraordinarily helpful in working with children and families. Um, if Medicaid was opened up through a waiver or whatever means or vehicles would uh, be required to make that permissible, um, to allow therapists to work directly with parents without the child present um, so they can more directly address parenting issues um, and also develop specific behavioral plans with the parent without the child. Um, oftentimes you want the child present in that family therapy session, um, but there are conversations that um, would be extraordinarily helpful to have with parents um, without the child present. And currently that is not a billable activity. Thank you. Are there further questions? All right, hearing none. Thank you very much, Randy, for uh, uh, participating in this. And, and I think you provided us with some great information. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, best of luck. Best of luck. Okay, next. Trying to operate two computers here, so I'm not necessarily the best at that. <laughs> Next, we have uh, an informational briefing on the 2017 and the 2018 Legislative Mental Health Task Forces, and that's going to be presented by Amy Campbell, a lobbyist and coordinator for the Kansas Mental Health Coalition. Welcome to committee, Amy. Good morning. Morning. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about the work of the mental health task forces. Um, you will note that in your agenda, it talks about the 2017 and 2018 legislative mental health task forces. In my testimony, I speak of them about the 2018 report and the 2019 report because those reports came out in the subsequent January. I have also provided a link to where you can read those reports on the front page of my testimony. 
I hope that all of you who are engaged in this activity of really looking at the system as a whole, we'll take a look at these reports. It's a pretty easy read. Um, what I will also say about this is that our work was facilitated, thanks to the legislature, by the Kansas Health Institute. They provided direction, they provided resources, and we were able to look to um, information from other states. We consulted with folks from surrounding states. We had a study, statewide study, about the need for the number of inpatient hospital beds in the state of Kansas that is included in this report. Um, and then what we have attempted to do with the report to make it user friendly is there are a number of references that show you where these topics are in the report, what pages to turn to, and the resources that are attached in the appendix of that report. Just for your information, there is a crosswalk in the appendix that shows how the recommendations of the mental health task force align with the recommendations of other task forces, such as the substance use treatment task force. So you will see that we have a lot of common recommendations within this report. Um, the legislature very specifically asked the task force to create a strategic plan that addressed the recommendations of the first task force report and also to ascertain the total number of psychiatric beds needed to most effectively deliver mental health services and the location where those services would be best provided. We also, um, in the initial task force report, looked over reports dating back 20 years that were advisory reports for everything from children's mental health services to the adult continuum of care committee. Um, some of this input also came from the work of the Governor's Behavioral, Sur Behavioral Health Services Planning Council you heard from Wes before. Uh, we are very encouraged that currently KDADS and its staff have taken these recommendations and are using them as some guidelines for work that they are moving forward with. However, it is very important that the Kansas legislature be dedicated to this strategic plan in order for these um, big items to be put into place. The task force report had several key points. There are 23 recommendations that build on that initial report. There are tables that show the action steps, the timing considerations, the implementation timing, and budget estimates on the costs for implementing those recommendations. The key points are expanding Medicaid would undergird many of the recommendations by improving access to behavioral health services at all levels of care, and allowing investment in workforce and capacity, restoring and increasing community outpatient mental health and substance use disorder treatment, primary care, housing, employment and peer programs will improve outcomes for individuals and families, immediately increasing inpatient psychiatric capacity for voluntary and involuntary admissions, and investing in the current state hospitals could end the moratorium on admissions at Osawatomie State Hospital and begin to alleviate pressure on the other systems, including hospital, emergency departments, and jails. It is worth noting that we continue to have a moratorium on admissions at Osawatomie State Hospital and that the COVID-19 pandemic led to a freeze on admissions temporarily at Larned State Hospital as well. Implementing a comprehensive plan to address needs at all levels and in all settings, including adding inpatient capacity up to 221 new beds over five years could stabilize the system. Regional infrastructure, including crisis stabilization centers, crisis intervention centers, and alternative models for rural areas will improve access and potentially reduce demand for long-term inpatient bed capacity and ensuring the financial support for prevention assessment, early intervention, and integrated care would have long-lasting effects. In my testimony, I took some excerpts from the report. Figure A, figure 1A and B talk about the levels of care and settings that comprise the behavioral health systems for adults and children. This is the continuum of care that the task force was very focused on, identifying where are the gaps across our state and how can we help to fill in those gaps? 
Figure two provides a quick view of the recommendations and the active action steps grouped by topic. Um, walking through those recommendations, you will find that many of them have received some action from the agency and from the legislature. I have attempted to include some of the action items taken by the past three legislator, excuse me, three legislatures as they relate to our reports. Um, I am, have also worked with Andy Brown to update the Appendix B showing the progress that has taken place, some of which has come just through agency action and no legislative involvement at all. What is important to recognize is that this is not just an issue of money. We have workforce crisis in front of us. We have issues relating to access for people, not just in the rural areas. You would be surprised at how many folks who have private insurance and live in an urban area cannot access residential substance use treatment. Um, so these are issues that exist completely across the state. I hope that the contents of this report can be useful to you. In particular, I think all of you would um, benefit from reading the first couple of sections that look at where the needs are across the state for inpatient treatment. And to understand that the folks who participated on this task force consider inpatient treatment to the, be the last resort. We prefer that folks are treated in the community and close to home. Um, but when those parts of the continuum of care are not robust and available, then we must rely on our inpatient system um, to care for these folks. I would like to also add that we had participation. If you look at page four of my testimony, there is a list of the participants of the task force. We did also engage participation from other folks who had done work in this area. Um, in particular, Wes Cole from the Planning Council was a participant and was consulted on this information, but he was serving as the interim superintendent during the 2019 report. Um, we also brought in Ed Klump from the Chiefs of Police. Many of you have heard from the concerns that law enforcement encounters when they end up being the social services outreach in the community um, for folks who are in crisis. And then I would just say that um, it's, I am here, I, I think that I've been asked to present this report a number of times just because of my lobbying experience, but the work of this committee in particular included uh, parents, um, folks who had been engaged in treatment themselves, and people who could look from the ground level at where the gaps occur when families are trying to um, access treatment and care. Um, if you look at those tables that talk about the continuum of care, I think any one of you can look at that and pick out many bullet points that are not available within an hour of your home. It's not that we think that every single item has to be available within an hour of home. The point is to know what is and isn't available, whether or not people can access it, and if that is not available, what is the plan to serve folks so that they don't have to um, end up in the ultimate level of personal crisis and either require hospitalization or all too often end up um, dying. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about the report. There's a lot of information in here. It is not all about money. A lot of it is about strategies. Um, but I encourage all of you who are legislators to grab onto a piece of this and think about how you can help it through to the finish line. Thank you very much. Questions for Amy. And we do have a raise hand feature on the uh, Zoom. Do? Senator McGinn. Thank you, Chairman Landwehr. I just want to let everybody know for the audience, um, if, if you can see us, we're having to come up to this computer mic and the committee members uh, will have to come up and talk to the mic next to the laptop if they have questions using the mic. Um, and when Senator Petty was up here, it's still um, a little sounding a little muffled, but this is the best we can do. So if Chairman, Madam Chair, if you see people approaching the laptop, you'll know we have a question. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. That was a lot clearer. I could hear Carolyn McGinn, and I think for some of our softer speaking individuals, it'll help to 
kind of escalate just a, a little bit. Not everyone speaks as loud as I do. So if there, are there any questions at all for Amy? All right, seeing none, thank you very much, Amy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next, next I have an informational briefing on the, uh, uh, no, where to go? On the Child Welfare Task Force and Robert Gilmore, Managing Research Analyst with uh, Kansas Legislative Research will update us. Welcome to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to be here. And uh, good morning to you and all the members of the committee and the audience. Uh, I was asked uh, to present a high level summary of the Child Welfare System Task Force's uh, activities during 2017 and 2018, as well as its recommendations. Uh, my name is Bob Gallimore. I'm with the Legislative Research Department, and I served as a staffer for that task force. We did prepare a memo for this morning. It's the memo that's on uh, green paper, and it goes into more detail regarding some of the information that I'll be covering. I would note that the memo references an attached crosswalk, and I neglected to attach the crosswalk. Uh, so we have made copies of that uh, in the same color paper for those who are in person. And that should have already been distributed to the audience. And I believe staff will be distributing that to committee members. And then we'll be working to get an updated PDF uploaded later today for those that are online. And my apologies that that was not in the original copy. That's fine. So the full report of the task force, which uh, runs over 150 pages, is of course available on the legislative website. And should anyone want to find that, we would be happy to help direct you to, to find that resource online. And because of the focus of this special committee today, I would note at the beginning that topics related to mental health did arise frequently in the work of the task force and uh, the work of the working groups that the task force formed. But I will uh, limit myself to specifically highlighting the topics and recommendations where the working groups or task force specif specifically referenced mental health issues and particularly the work of the mental health task force, which you just heard about, which was ongoing at the same time. So the Child Welfare System Task Force was formed by the legislature in 2017 after there had been two special committees on foster care adequacy the previous two years. And those special committees had looked at various topics related to the child welfare system. And the 2016 special committee recommended that the task force, uh, that a task force be formed. And the 2017 legislature then passed House Substitute for Senate Bill 126 which actually formed the task force, uh, or rather directed the Secretary for Children and Families to establish the Child Welfare System Task Force to study the child welfare system in the state of Kansas. So SB 126 also directed the task force to form working groups to study a number of topics. These topics included the general administration of child welfare by the Kansas Department for Children and Families, or DCF, protective services, family preservation, reintegration, foster care, and permanency placement. The task force and the working groups were also directed to study five additional specific issues related to the child welfare system. Now those are set out uh, in the memo, but I would note that one of those additional specific issues directed for study was the level of access to child welfare services, including, but not limited to, health and mental health services and community-based services in the state of Kansas. SB 126 also established the membership of the task force, which included legislators as well as representatives of various stakeholders in the child welfare system. The task force decided to form three working groups and directed each of those working groups to study two of the topics that were assigned by SB 126. So the three working groups wound up being a working group focused on the general administration of child welfare and foster care, a working group focused on protective services and family preservation, and a working group focused on reintegration and permanency placement. The task force itself met five times in 2017, 
And obviously a lot of the work in 2017 was organizational, such as forming the working groups, but the task force also received a lot of background information, as well as overviews regarding different aspects of the child welfare system. And these overviews included DCF's organizational structure, as well as the child welfare system case process, legislative post audit reports regarding various aspects of the child welfare system, foster care contracts, the court's role in and judicial perspectives on the child welfare system, an overview of the history of privatization of the child welfare system, and the roles of the Department of Health and Environment and the Department for Aging and Disability Services in the child welfare system. So SB 126 required the task force to submit a preliminary report to the 2018 legislature, to, which included a summary of its activities to that point, and the task force also identified eight concerns that uh, it had been able to uh, uh, find to that point, as well as 10 preliminary recommendations. Now, again, a number of those identified concerns and prelim preliminary recommendations uh, did involve mental health issues or topics in some way. But I would note specifically, uh, one concern identified was a significant decrease in the number of beds for children and youth in psychiatric residential treatment facilities, or PRTS, in Kansas. And the task force had a related preliminary recommendation, uh, and that recommendation was that problems that have led to the closure of several PRTFs for children and youth should be addressed so that more PRTFs can be added. So moving to the 2018 working group and task force activity, uh, the task force itself met six times in 2018, which was primarily after the legislative session had concluded. And that's because while the session was ongoing, the working groups were busy hearing testimony on the issues that had been identified by the bill, by the task force, and by the working groups themselves. The working groups then conducted discussion and uh, finalized sets of recommendations to the task force. So each working group met seven to nine times in 2018. And they also invited members of the public to submit testimony. Uh, there were about 50 uh, testimonies submitted to the working groups. And most of those were approved for distribution to the working groups. And then from these submissions, the working groups selected persons to uh, come in and present oral testimony. And they also heard from subject matter experts from various organizations. Each working group heard uh, verbal testimony at several of its 2018 meetings. And after hearing and uh, reviewing all this testimony, uh, each working group consolidated and ranked a list of recommendations by consensus. The working groups finalized a total of 26 recommendations, including 12 that they designated as high priority. For each recommendation, the working groups identified actions that would be needed to implement the recommendation. They also identified supporting strategies to be considered in implementing the recommendation. And they highlighted testimony related to the recommendation, as well as evidence from any other states programs that informed or could be instructive in implementing that recommendation. For their high priority recommendations, the working groups also identified uh, actions required to implement and certain standard characteristics of each of those recommendations. So then getting back to the task force uh, at the August and September task force meetings. Uh, working group members presented the task force with an overview of their recommendation, as well as the supporting strategies, and uh, as well as some of the testimony they had identified related to that uh, recommendation. While the working groups had been working through all the testimony and developing their own recommendations, the task force uh, had had a few meetings uh, in February of 2018, they heard perspectives of youth leaders and independent advocacy organizations. And they also received information from KDADS regarding those PRTFs. In July, they heard an overview of the Family First Prevention Services Act, and they also were updated on the 2018 legislative session. And then, as I mentioned, in August and September, they had heard the presentations by the working groups. So following that, the task force began preparation of its own recommendations uh, and its draft report, and they ultimately finalized that in December 2018. 
So in developing its own recommendations, the task force discussed and modified and in some cases combined recommendations from the working groups and they ultimately finalized 23 of their own recommendations. And they organized those recommendations by priority into three tiers. Now within, the, within each tier, there was no particular ranking. Uh, the only uh, prioritization was by tier level. And then of course, uh, under SB 126, the task force's work was completed once it had submitted that final report and the statute set it to sunset uh, as of July 1st, 2019. Now, before I wrap up, um, to uh, briefly speak to the, the specific recommendations uh, that reference the mental health task force recommendations. Um, again, a number of topics that the task force and the working groups looked at involved mental health issues. And I believe the next presentation is going to cover some of those recommendations more broadly. Uh, as it presents uh, uh, another crosswalk uh, about some of these groups and their, their recommendations that relate to mental health. So you will be getting more information on that. So for now, I would just like to note that the Child Welfare System Task Force in its recommendations did urge consideration in two of those recommendations of several specific recommendations by the Mental Health Task Force. And those two recommendations. Uh, the first one related to safety net, early childhood programs, and early intervention. Uh, the recommendation was that the state should fully fund, strengthen, and expand safety net and early childhood programs through public services, including DCF, mental health, substance abuse, and education, and community-based partner programs, and reduce barriers for families needing to access concrete supports. The state should ensure availability and adequate access to early childhood behavioral health services statewide. And the task force recommends consideration of related mental health task force recommendations 1.2 related to Medicaid expansion models, 1.3 related to housing, 3.1 relating to regional model, and 6.4 relating to early intervention. And then uh, for a recommendation related to non-abuse neglect, the task force recommended the state should provide differential responses for newborns and refer them to evidence-based services. The task force recommends consideration of related mental health task force recommendation 6.1 related to expanding service options, 4.2 related to regional model, and 6.4 related to early intervention. Now again, um, We've distributed to those in person the, the crosswalk that's supposed to be attached to the memo um, that uh, KHI prepared in its role as a facilitator for the working groups. That is keyed to the recommendations by the working groups. So as I mentioned, the, uh, some of the working group recommendations were then consolidated into child welfare system, uh, the, the task force recommendations. Um, so that, that Crosswalk is keyed to the working groups and not um, specifically the task force recommendations, but ultimately all that content was in the, the task force's recommendations itself. And uh, we will uh, again be uploading an updated copy of the memo uh, with that crosswalk attached. And, and again, my apologies that that, that was not already available. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty much uh, what I have prepared for the committee. Uh, of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, get more information if I don't, uh, uh, if I'm not immediately able to answer them. All right. Do we have uh, questions for Robert? All right. Seeing none, Robert, thank you very much. I guess, you know, one of the things uh, committee and, and I think we're going to hear this throughout is uh, making sure that we look at how we can address the, imp the sharing of information. I think that's definitely one of the roadblocks that we hit. At the same time, we have to be very cautious of uh, privacy issues. So, Next, we have a staff overview uh, on the Governor's Substance Abuse Disorder Task Force, the Behavioral, the Crosswalk. Who's doing that one, Dave? Madam Chair, this is Marisa from KLRD. Can you hear me on this mic? You know, I think it'd be better if you said at the computer, if that's all right. I can kind of hear you, but it's, I think it's clear when I, I can hear Carolyn, uh, Senator McGinn, very clear. Is this better? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Okay, I'll go ahead and start. Again, this is Marisa Bayless, research analyst from KLRD. I have a memo in front of you titled Crosswalk Recommendations Concerning Kansas Mental Health. Uh, on the outset, I had uh, just provided brief summaries of the different working groups and task forces that have already been talked about. So I'm not gonna go into that uh, in depth at all since you've already had presentations over that. I will note in the memo, however, we did provide a legend with acronyms um, that are most commonly used in the mental health uh, world. So there's that is there for a reference in case you ever need it. Uh, turning more to the spreadsheet that's in front of you. This is titled uh, Recent Behavior Health and Mental Health Committees and Task Force Recommendations, the KLRD Crosswalk. So this uh, is an attempt to try and bring all these recommendations from all these different groups into a more organized format um, and to try and definitely show some of the common trends that all of the groups have been working on. We'll talk a little bit more later today about the work groups, but uh, uh, the way the crosswalk is organized is by the work groups first. So we have work group one, finance and sustainability, work group two, policy and treatment, and work group three, system capacity and transformation. So within those work groups, we tried to assign some topics that we felt uh, worked best in those areas. So under work group one, finance and su sustainability, we have topic one, workforce, topic two, funding and accessibility, topic three, community engagement. And this crosswalk is definitely intended to be a baseline. Um, I think arguably you could probably put topic one workforce into any of these different work groups and it would probably fit in there. Um, so this is definitely just a baseline for the special committee and also the working groups to kind of read over, take it how it is and go forward with it, what they think is best in working with these different groups um, and how they best see fit uh, that they're gonna get the most um, work product out of this. I will say that as you review them, there's definitely a lot of commonalities. I think topic two under the workforce or topic two under work group two, uh, funding accessibility definitely had some of the most common recommendations on that area. Uh, topic seven, data systems, definitely also had a lot of overlap between all the different committees. And also the interaction with the legal system and law enforcement was definitely one that I saw had uh, a lot of common recommendations concerning that area. I wanna note that all the reports that have been referenced are available on KR KLRD's website for your review um, at one location. So that would probably be helpful also to note, the Crossover Youth Working Group uh, didn't necessarily provide recommendations to the legislature. They provided further study considerations. Uh, so the language on those might be a little different, but that definitely that group was definitely working more on a, looking at an analytical side of the working group. And for the Mental Health Task Force, it was also mentioned prior uh, action steps that were available in the 2019 report. We did not include the action steps on this uh, chart as that would have created an even longer document for you, but those act action steps are definitely very important to the recommendations that the Mental Health, health Task Force uh, produced. I'm available for any questions on this. This was just an intended overview of how we've organized these recommendations and hopefully will provide a good starting point for the committee and the working groups. All right, do we have questions for Marissa, anyone? Not in our room. All right, well, is there someone on Zoom that does? So I guess Marissa, if we are you know, to look at this entire report that you've provided for us, it gives us a good snapshot of what has been looked at what has been addressed, but not necessarily what was recommended and hasn't been addressed. Would that be a accurate assumption? Yeah, that would be an accurate assumption. Um, a lot of these, especially the mental health task force, since they did a 2018 report and then a follow-up of a 2019 report, um, some of these recommendations have been acted on and I would reference Amy Campbell's uh, testimony who provided some updates for that. But if anyone has 
any questions on a particular recommendation, we can always find uh, and reference the reports a little bit more quickly for you. Um, if you wanna know if there was a specific action item um, that has already been done either by an agency, I know we're getting those reports later this afternoon um, or any uh, legislative work on that. Um, but this definitely was just looking more broadly at all, all the recommendations and trying to um, narrow them down into different topic areas or subject matters that have all been talked about within these uh, workforces and councils. Well, and I think it's important for everyone to understand as we progress through this is that we have the, the statute process and then there's the rules and regs process. And then there's also things that the agencies are able to do that don't necessarily run through either one of those processes. Would that be correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, but I think sometimes people just look at, at what we do. It's kind of like, uh, you know, yesterday I had, was going over a uh, recent statute we had put into place and thought we understood what was occurring, but once we looked at the rules and regs, it became a different issue. So that's real important for us to keep in mind as we go through these, what our agencies are doing. I believe that Representative Ballard may have a question. Is that correct? You can always walk up early, Representative. Sorry to have you get up and down, Marissa. <laughs> oh, it's fine. I'll get my steps in. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I I wanted to make a comment to Marissa and the staff, especially about the abbreviations and the acronyms uh, used on the mental health. Because often, you know, when you we 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 think we know some of those until I go to explain it to people. So I wanted to just say I appreciate having those here as well. And I think the question I have is the crossover youth working group. Is there any more information on that? And maybe Marissa should be the one to answer that question. Did you hear me okay, Madam Chair? Yes, I did. Thank you. Hope you're doing well, by the way. I am, thank you, Representative. Um, yeah, so the final report of the Crossover Youth Working Group is available on KLRD, but the Crossover Youth Working Group also provide also did a working group report, an interim report, and a final report. So there's further study recommendations that we grabbed for the uh, crosswalk or from the final report, but the working group report and the interim report definitely provide um, even more information on the uh, final product that the Crossover Youth Working Group had ended up with. Thank you. Did you have anything further, Representative Ballard? Okay. Well, Madam Chair, I'm fine, thank you. All right. Yeah, I think one of the things as we started this, this process and we started putting together our agenda and what we felt information was necessary for the committees, it was you know, interesting even to myself, all of the reports that have been issued out there and a number of them I had actually reviewed, but there were several of them that I was not familiar with. So I think I felt like it was a really good starting point for us to figure out what's been kind of looked at out there so we don't totally have to go out and rent, rent, reinvent a wheel. And so I know you're, you're given a whole lot of information today and it doesn't mean that you have to absorb it all. You're gonna have plenty of time to look over some of this stuff. I know that I found the mental health task report refreshing in going back and reminding me of why we did some of the things we did and why we did it the way we did it. Uh, so it's a little, it's kind of good to get some of that history because I think it, it helps us to advance forward what we're attempting to do here today. Are there any further questions for Marissa on this uh, overview? This is Marissa, thank you very much. I appreciate the- Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Not believe I'm running ahead of time. That never happens in one of my committees. Well, is there- 
are there any comments or any discussion that some of our uh, non-legislative members have for us on that they'd like to share with us right now? We are running early lunch isn't expected to be until about 1130 for our uh, committee members. Because you've all been kind of quiet. Legislators aren't normally quiet and I'm kind of seeing quiet from uh, the members. Madam Chair uh, Landwehr, I have a possible suggestion. Yes, Senator uh, McGinn. I was wondering if, uh, if you wanted to maybe just take a 10 or 15 minute break. And then I didn't know if you wanted to see if anybody on the afternoon session would want to try to present at all. Um, but it just give us a chance to regroup our uh, agenda. That sounds fine to me. Let's go ahead and do that. And be back here at 11. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Appreciate that, uh, Vice Chair McGinn. So we will recess for 15 minutes. Since on somebody I'm going to communicate with the chair is David and see if anybody in the afternoon wants to just go ahead and raise their hands up to this.
Hello. Yes. Hi, Dave. Okay.
Okay, I'm going to assume that we're back. I'm still seeing Robin's screen for some reason. Robin, I'm still seeing your screen. There we go. Now we're opening up. So I believe that we're going to open, reconvene and open up the uh, discussion with um, Andy Brown, the Commissioner of Behavioral Health with the Kansas Department of Aging and Disabilities, which you've also heard us refer to as KDADS earlier. Hi, my name is Andy Brown. I'm the uh, Commissioner for Behavioral Health Services at KDADS and Chairwoman and members of the committee. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I am very excited for this opportunity to focus legislative attention on behavioral health in Kansas. And I'd like to take a minute to thank really all the, excuse me. Um, but I would like to take the opportunity to thank um, all of the volunteers and advocates that have worked to make these recommendations over the last several years for their time and energy serving on the task forces and committees that have produced these reports um, and recommendations. Um, so in my presentation, um, if we begin on slide two, this is really an overview of um, progress that KDADS has been working on um, based on these various report recommendations. Um, we'll reference actions taken by KDADS to address those recommendations. Um, including the legislative mental health task forces that met over the 2017 and 18 legislative interims, the governor's substance use disorder task force, the governor's behavioral health services planning council, and the child welfare task force in the crossover youth working group. Um, there is a uh, updated response to the 2019 mental health task force report um, and the KDAD's 2019 strategic planning document that has also been submitted as an attachment for review by the committee as additional documentation. And KDAD's also wants to bring your attention to the fact that we recently submitted a mental health and jail state action plan that outlines a plan in response to the legislative post audit and recommendations from 2018. That plan was developed in collaboration with the Sheriff's Association and the Association of Community Mental Health Centers over about six months in fiscal year 20. Um, and that report is available on our website um, for public review. So last year, KDAD submitted 18 budget enhancements for fiscal year 21 that totaled $74.5 million in all funds. I can hear him. Are you people having trouble hearing me? Um, so those, those report, which report are you going off of? I'm sorry. Sorry, this is this is the presentation to special committee on Kansas mental health modernization and reform on KDAD's responses to recommendations from recent task forces and other groups focusing on mental health. Um, and this is the PowerPoint presentation, and okay. I am on slide four. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so last year, um, like I was saying, we submitted 18 budget enhancements for fiscal year 21 that totaled almost $75 million all funds. Um, 15 of those enhancements were specifically related to fulfilling recommendations within the 2019 Mental Health Task Force Report and from the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council. In fiscal year 21, Kate has received appropriations associated with the plan to lift the moratorium at Osawatomie State Hospital and to open a children's acute psychiatric hospital in Hayes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we are currently working on um, getting out an RFP for that particular project. Additionally, available lotto vending machine funding will allow the state to support an additional crisis center in Douglas County um, that is scheduled to open in the following fiscal year. 
So our KDAD strategic goals um, are outlined in the KDAD's 2019 strategic planning document that's attached to this presentation. And it focuses on eight long-term goals for KDADs during the Governor Kelly administration as summarized below. First, we're gonna work on modernizing the continuum of care. We wanna revitalize our uh, self-direction and self-determination among advocates and consumers. We wanna improve consumer-driven decision-making so that the decisions we are making are focused on individuals we're trying to serve. We wanna increase meaningful and community-integrated employment. Um, we wanna implement comprehensive community-based housing. Um, these are both social determinants of health, housing and employment. And it's important that if we're gonna work on trying to um, reintegrate people into the community, um, that those services be available. We also are working to improve workforce development. Uh, we're moving towards data-informed continuous quality improvement. And we're also working to adopt strategic prevention framework uh, within our decision-making and processes. So there are also 50 related short-term goals for 2020 through 2022. Um, and those have been described within that document. Many of those are directly connected to recommendations made in recent reports and significant progress has already been made on a number of those goals. So I'm gonna begin by talking about the Mental Health Task Force report um, from January 14th, 2019. So this report has recommendations in the seven topic areas that were discussed earlier today, and it does include a crosswalk of the Mental Health Task Force recommendations with the Governor's SUD Task Force recommendations and the Child Welfare System Task Force recommendations in Appendix D. The report also has an update on the implementation status of previous mental health task force recommendations. The seven topic areas in that report are system transformation, maximizing federal funding and funding from other sources, continuum of care for children and youth, nursing facilities for mental health, workforce, suicide prevention, and learning across systems. KDADS worked with the mental health task force report, uh, mental health task force to um, review this report and um, I feel like it's been a very good tool for us as we've been laying out our strategies for how we want to work on the mental health system in Kansas. Our system transformation, um, for, for this progress update, um, KDES has made fairly significant progress in this topic area. Um, so here are some of the things that we've done in the last year and a half. KDADS has developed a plan to lift the moratorium at Osawatomie State Hospital that will allow the moratorium on voluntary admissions to be ended in 2021. KDADS established a new hospital commission and appointed a new deputy secretary to oversee state institutions. This was done in order to allow for more focus to be provided on community-based services by the Behavioral Health Services Commission. KDADS has also created a new provider status known as the State Institute Alternative, which is allows regional hospitals to serve Kansans as though they were state hospitals. Those policies are currently um, being approved and published by KDHE um, and will be effective this year. Regulations for the Crisis Intervention Act are currently being drafted and should be available to license new crisis intervention centers in 2021 and will include uniform medical necessity criteria. New crisis stabilization units have been established and funded in some areas of the state that may not support fully licensed crisis intervention centers. We've added those through our lottery funding and also through some state general funding. KDADS has partnered with DCF to support the establishment of a statewide mobile crisis program for youth. They've recently RFP'd that and are currently going through the bidding process. Um, and we anticipate that that program will be up and running soon under the Family First Prevention Services Act. KDES has completed the Housing First Bridge Project pilot that's mentioned in the report, and it's created Medicaid billing codes known as Operation Community Integration, or OIC, to promote Housing First models for SUD and CMHC providers. That's been in place now for about a year, and we're currently reviewing data that's been provided by providers and the MCOs to look at utilization of that code and also see if there's ways we can improve it. Additionally, we're also currently seeking additional TA support from um, a federal provider um, with NASDAQ to look at how SUD and um, housing can be 
um, provided through Medicaid. KDADS is also working to expand its efforts to prioritize and ex expedite the reactivation of federal benefits, including Medicaid for disabled individuals discharging from institutions in order to promote successful community integration. This is important because by connecting to benefits, um, we have ways of paying for services and supporting um, individuals um, in their home life in the community. So for the Children's Continuum of Care Progress Update, um, KDES has really done an impressive amount of work in this topic over the last 18 months. KDEDS uh, began by establishing a division within Behavioral Health Services Commission that is led by a new director that focuses on children and youth. This has allowed us to really zero in on some of the issues that were um, in place um, in the system and work on addressing some of the gaps and barriers that we've seen. KDEDS has held a statewide Children's Behavioral Health Summit in Topeka uh, and in a series of meetings in Western Kansas to discuss access to care and the need for services in Kansas communities. KDES has also begun work on creating a parent peer support service for parents of children with severe emotional disturbances. This is something that parents have told us they would really appreciate uh, being a part of the service delivery for that waiver. KDES has sought additional referral federal funding for the expansion of the Systems of Care grant activities. However, this funding was not awarded for federal fiscal year 21. Um, so we will be trying to look at ways we might be able to sustain uh, progress made through those grants um, in other ways. KDADS worked with DCF to institute the Family First Prevention Services Act and the Crisis Intervention Services. Um, KDADS has increased our parent support opportunities through pilot projects and assistance of care grant. This has not fully expanded eligibility statewide, but KDES is exploring options to continue to see if there's ways we can do that. KDES has also incorporated ACEs training into its prevention strategies and works with KDHE on ACEs as a public health strategy. Um, ACEs is also um, heavily referenced at um, the uh, justice involved youth as well and the crossover youth. KDES has worked closely with DCF and other state agencies on transition aged youth under the proviso to closely examine the ways that their efforts can be coordinated. Uh, KDES is trying to help pursue the establishment of a juvenile crisis intervention center. Um, last year, we issued an RFP. Ultimately, that bid was closed without an award being made. Um, but we are currently working with DCF and KDOC to um, see what we can do about reissuing an RFP this year. So um, there's a specific reference in the task force to PRTFs, that's recommendation 3.3. It is part of the overall recommendations of the Children's Continuum of Care, but I wanted to provide kind of a specific update about that. Um, because it's been a hot topic over recent years. So the psychiatric residential treatment facilities, otherwise known as PRTFs in Kansas, have struggled to meet the demand for services among can care members for several years. KDES has been working to address this issue from multiple angles, including consideration of the Mental Health Task Force Recommendation 3.3. While KDES has not implemented all of the recommendations in 3.3, its combined efforts have resulted in a marked reduction in the CanCare MCO waitlist for PRTF admissions of about 50% from fiscal year 19. KDES has implemented recommendation 3.3A and created both new draft regulations for PRTFs, which are being reviewed by our legal team, and new medical necessity criteria for PRTFs. KDES has also established a direct role in reviewing individual members on the MCO waitlist with the MCOs and DCF on a weekly basis in order to assure that those members are receiving home community-based services, continue to meet medical necessity, and that additional treatment options have been considered. KDES has also worked to expand PRTF capacity in Kansas, which was not part of the Mental Health Task Force recommendations, but has been a priority for some children's advocates in Kansas. KDADS is also currently working with providers to establish PRTF programs for higher acuity children with histories of violence or sexual assaults that are more difficult to treat in current PRTFs and remain on the waiting list for longer periods of time as a result. The 
another recommendation area was the nursing facilities for mental health. Um, KDADS has made progress in the following areas regarding those recommendations. KDADS has been approved for a 115 IMD exclusion demonstration waiver from CMS. KDADS is currently in the process of submitting an implementation plan and evaluation plan for CMS approval. The timeline on that typically runs probably about six to 12 months in terms of getting the approvals in place and beginning implementation. KDAS has also approved rate exceptions and NFMHs as incentives for additional training and services. KDAS has funded special training for NFMH staff over the last three years through a special grant fund. KDAS has convened meetings with community service providers and NFMH directors to connect residents with additional services. And KDAS continues to meet monthly with the NFMH directors in order to explore ways to improve those connections. KDAS also prioritizes and expedites the NFMH residents to reconnect them with benefits to facilitate more successful community integration. KDAS is working with developing a pilot program that will help provide temporary supportive housing while waiting for permanent benefits to be established. And this is important because as people are coming out of NFMHs, it does take time to get them reconnected to those benefits. And so having a temporary program that will provide supportive services to maintain their housing is important in the community. GATADS has also worked to update its continued stay process, which is designed to determine if medical necessity criteria continues to be met by NFMH residents. Um, and we're working on reducing the number of continued stays um, each year as we move forward. For workforce recommendations, KDADS has made progress in the following areas. Um, KDADS has met with the recently federally funded Mental Health Technology Transfer Center to get technical assistance on workforce issues. We're planning to work with KHI to develop a white paper on workforce strategies using stakeholder engagement. This unfortunately has been delayed in part due to the public health emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's just made it difficult for us to um, proceed forward at this point. KDADS has expanded training opportunities for peer support services. Both level one and level two trainings are available and supervisory training is now also available online. KDADS is working to finalize updates to the online peer training um, and it should all be available later this fall. KDADS has increased reimbursement rates for both SUD and mental health peer support services by 10% this year. Um, that's been on both the Medicaid side and on our block grant side. Additionally, KDADS has added performance measures to the CanCare MCO contracts around increasing the utilization of peer support. This has resulted in additional incentives being offered by the MCOs to providers for implementing these services. For suicide prevention, uh, this is a topic that's particularly important to me. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways to build infrastructure in Kansas around suicide prevention. Um, but we have made some significant efforts um, and, and some progress on these recommendations. So for first off, we recently led the Kansas team for Governor's Challenge to prevent suicide among service members, veterans, and their families. This TA opportunity allowed us to develop a plan that KDADS has been working to implement over the last year. The Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council Prevention Subcommittee has drafted a new five-year state suicide prevention plan, which is currently being reviewed for input by stakeholders around the state prior to convening of stakeholders of the agencies next month. So we're looking forward to that um, opportunity. We're gonna announce that we're gonna work to try to kick off a statewide suicide prevention coalition uh, and try to recruit steering committee members uh, to help us form that group. KDAS has not yet been able to create and fund a full-time state suicide prevention coordinator position or establish significant dedicated funding for suicide prevention efforts. KDADS did include both of those items in the fiscal year 21 budget enhancements, but ultimately they were not funded. KDADS has partnered with state agencies and stakeholders to establish an interagency work group on youth suicide prevention. And this collaboration has led to better coordinated efforts across agencies. KDADS has also applied for and is participating in the federal technical assistance on developing state infrastructure for suicide prevention. The Suicide Prevention Resource Center um, at the national level issued um, 
sort of recommendations on how to build infrastructure for states. Um, so we've been working through a process with um, three other states to try and uh, lay out a, a plan for how we will build infrastructure here in Kansas. And the first step in that is gonna be putting together that coalition. So now I'm gonna to switch to the Child Welfare System, Welfare System Task Force report uh, that was came out in January, 2019. So this report has 23 recommendations in three tiers and includes a crosswalk of the Mental Health Task Force recommendations in Appendix A of that report. The final recommendations related to mental health are found in tier one, um, access to care, tier two, foster care, reentry and transitional services, and also in tier two, the safety net, early childhood programs and early intervention. With regards to access to care, our progress update is that this recommendation is designed to require high quality and consistent behavioral health care for Medicaid eligible high risk youth through the Medicaid state plan or other appropriate funding sources. KDADS currently works with KDHE on offering serious emotional disturbance SED waiver services through CanCare. These waivers are currently available and do not require a wait list. Services for the SED waiver are provided by the CMHCs. Um, and we currently work with the MCOs to try to make sure that any children that are referred to PRTFs for admissions are also connected uh, to the SED waiver. The MCO waitlist for PRTF admissions was of specific concern to the task force and KDADS has taken measures described earlier in this presentation to address the waitlist. On 8-17-20, there were 21 foster care youth on the MCO waitlist for PRTF admissions, and KDADS is working to reduce that number further. For foster care reentry and transitional services, this recommendation is to provide young adults ages 18 to 21 with the option to seamlessly reenter the child welfare system and ensure the continuity and behavioral health care for youth who have exited the custody of DCF. KDAS is not directly involved with reentry, but is involved with working closely with DCF on transition aged youth to try and increase successful community integration for those youth with behavioral health needs. So in that regard, we've offered support through Medicaid and through federal block grant funding for those not covered by other insurance. Specifically, the upper, Operation Community Integration OCI codes added to CanCare last year allow CMHCs and SUD providers to create housing support programs which are available for transition age youth. KDAS has also worked with DCF and CMHCs to develop a universal jacket that creates a psychiatric history for each youth, which can then be used to help establish federal disability claims and expedite connections to those benefits. For the safety net, early childhood programs and early intervention progress update, um, this recommendation was to fully fund and ensure availability and adequate access to early childhood behavioral health services statewide. It also specifically refers to several recommendations from the Mental Health Task Force report. And while DCF has secured funding for the Family First Prevention Services Act programs and has begun to fully implement those programs for at-risk youth, KDAS last year was able to increase the MHC-based funding agreements to replace lost funding in the previous decade. Behavioral health services for children is still inadequately funded to ensure services are available statewide. At the Children's Behavioral Health Summit in Topeka last year, both parent advocates and CMHCs discussed the continued challenges of accessing and providing these services with KDADS and MCOs, much of which was related to the capacity of the workforce and the ability to pay competitive wages to attract and retain employees. During the public health emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic, KDADS and KDHE have vastly expanded the role of telemedicine and behavioral health services and believe that this is having a positive impact on families of children and accessing behavioral health services. And while much work still needs to be done to fully realize the Mental Health Task Force recommendations on early childhood programs, KDADS believes that maintaining this telemedicine expansion will aid in our efforts to provide equal access across the state. So now I'd like to take a minute and switch over to the Crossover Youth Working Group final report uh, that came out in January 2020. Um, this report was mostly a study, um, and so it presented key findings rather than um, clear recommendations in six topic areas 
um, only one of those specifically focused on mental health, and that was the services for crossover youth topic. So the report's top findings included that crossover youth are not captured in data collection systems. Contact with law enforcement is an important entry point. Passage of Senate Bill 367 has limited the authority of law enforcement to place youth in detention for their own safety. And one of the largest barriers to services is placement instability. The report also identified gaps in services. KDAS has not yet had significant time to begin structured planning on how to address all of these findings. Um, however, some of the findings are consistent across recommendations from stakeholder groups and other reports. KDAS continues to work um, in order to use evidence-based programs um, identified in the Proviso Point 8 and has established an EBP work group as part of the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council that will help review and recommend additional EBPs. For Proviso Point 12, KDADS continues to work on improving PRTF waiting lists and services and would highlight recent efforts to create specialty PRTF units for crossover youth with violent or sexual assault histories. For Proviso Point 15, KDADS intends to work with DCF, KDOC, and the Association of Community Mental Health Centers of Kansas to further explore the CMHC role in serving crossover youth and their needs with regards to capacity building. KDADS also continues to encourage use of the SED waiver for crossover youth as there are available waivers and no wait list. KDADS also continues to evaluate the provider's request for parent only sessions, child not present on the waiver to be reimbursed by CANCARE. KDADS did attempt to find a contractor for the JCIC through the RFP process last year, but was not able to make an award. DCF attempted the year prior uh, to issue an RFP and it had the same results. Um, so we are trying to go back to the drawing board and see what we can do to um, facilitate um, finding a contractor that we can work with to build or uh, implement a JCIC in Kansas. Um, private children's acute psychiatric care hospitals are available in Kansas and do not have wait lists. However, they are not evenly distributed around the state. Um, as we heard earlier, this still remains an issue in Western Kansas. Um, KDADS is working on an RFP to open a new children's hospital in Hayes, which would add capacity to the western half of the state. So um, now I'll switch to the Substance Use Disorders Task Force report, which is dated September 2018. Um, this report has 34 high priority recommendations in five topic areas and includes a list of additional unprioritized recommendations in Appendix B of that report. The report has recommendations in the following topic areas, provider education, prevention, treatment and recovery, law enforcement, and neonatal abstinence syndrome. So for provider education, um, KDADS has offered provider trainings on opioid use disorder through the state opioid response grant and by co-hosting the Kansas Opioid Conference with KDHE annually. KDADS has worked with the Board of Pharmacy and KDHE to include KTRACT objectives in the health IT plan for our SUD IMD demonstration waiver implementation plan. KDADS also recommends that this, comp this committee seek input from the Board of Pharmacy about specific KTRAX objectives and KDHE on their CDC funded efforts around provider education. For prevention, um, KDAS has made a lot of progress in the prevention area. Um, KDAS has a robust prevention effort that promotes safe use, storage, and disposal of prescription medications. This work has been entirely federally funded through grants. KDADS has helped promote and expand safe disposal sites in Kansas. We've been promoting awareness through public media campaigns and targeted communities. Um, KDADS supports local prevention coalitions through the Kansas Prevention Collaborative. KDADS also collects data using the Communities That Care survey. Um, KDADS has been advocating for changes or an exemption for this survey from state laws that currently require parents to opt their children into participating in the survey. This data is used for the Kansas Behavioral Health Indicators dashboard and to provide county specific reports on selected prevention metrics. Um, the, the real issue with this survey is, is that, um, you know, when, when we were no longer able to 
have parents opt out, right? So that their, their permission had to be given for the child not to take the survey. Uh, it significantly decreased um, the reliability of the data based on the number of children that were responding to the survey. Um, we've made quite a bit of progress um, by changing some of the ways that we implement the survey in order to try to um, encourage more parent participation in the survey. Um, but we still, I think, would benefit significantly by having an exemption and or a, um, a change in the law that allowed for the survey to be an opt out rather than an opt in survey. KDADS has sought additional funding for prevention efforts. Um, currently, these programs are entirely federally funded and limited in their reach. Um, so it would be beneficial for additional state funding to be allocated for prevention efforts. KDADS has also begun hosting an annual Kansas Prevention Conference to support local communities in their prevention efforts. Um, KDADS also offers a quarterly Prevention Works webinar and offers national um, substance abuse prevention skills training prevention uh, training for a cadre of trainers that we have here in the state um, that are then able to deliver that training right now during COVID online. For treatment and recovery, KDADS has made um, a fair amount of progress on treatment and recovery recommendations. Um, some of those things are, are as follows. We have the KDADS increased the waiver prescribers of buprenorphine through the SOR grant. Um, we've worked to facilitate service integration for SUD services with mental health and primary care. Currently, KDADS is working with KDHE and FQHCs on federal technical assistance related to this topic. KDADS promotes screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, also known as ESPERT, through the CANCARE and SOR grant. KDADS has increased the SUD provider payment rates for the uninsured and added money to the program from the SOR grant. Um, in our next round of SOR funding, which will be SOR2 starting in October, um, we'll also be able to use those opioid funds to help treat stimulant. Um, and, and I want to say that that's a very significant thing for Kansas. Um, we've been advocating for the last several years um, that states in the Midwest like Kansas have a much more significant problem with stimulants than we do with opioids. Um, and being able to use this federal funds for stimulant is going to really help us um, use those funds to reach out and provide services to more people. KDES has also increased Medicaid reimbursement rates for peer support by 10% this year. KDES has begun implementing the SUD IMD exclusion demonstration. KDES has replaced the KCPC with a temporary SUD data collection tool known as KSERS and is developing an RFP for a statewide solution that would integrate behavioral health IT systems and replace more of the former functionality of the KCPC on a permanent basis. And finally, KDADS has also been seeking increased state funding for SUD treatment and recovery services to support expansion of supported housing and employment services for people returning to communities after inpatient treatment. So for law enforcement, um, KDADS has added community-based jail liaison positions to the CMHC agreements to support pre-release services. KDADS has also expanded and increased efforts to expedite reconnection to eligible benefits upon release. KDADS has contracted with the Council of State Governments to launch a Kansas Stepping Up Initiative TA Center to support local law enforcement and district attorneys in a variety of pre-charge and post-charge jail diversion efforts. KDADS has supported naloxone training and supplies for law enforcement through our fir and first responders through our SOR grant. KDADS has also added additional training for smaller law enforcement agencies that do not have the ability to create CIT councils of their own or participate in CIT training at the Kansas Law Enforcement Center. KDADS State Action Plan for Mental Health and Jails was developed in conjunction with law enforcement associations and includes elements that will also help address SUD services. KDADS has invested in creating opportunities for integrating sobering beds and detox facilities within crisis stabilization unit programs. 
And KDAS is also currently working with KDOC on technical assistance from the Council of State Governments Justice Center on behavioral health services as part of reform efforts. KDAS has also been working with the SMDF TA Center to support crisis intercept mapping and mayor's challenges efforts in Topeka. We're also hoping to be able to expand those governor challenges to other cities in the state. For neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, KDHE has made a significant amount of progress on these recommendations. KDAD's role really has just been to provide support to KDHE and their efforts utilizing SOR grant resources to support treatment and recovery services for uninsured pregnant women. KDAD has a position responsible for fulfilling the role of state women's treatment coordinator with SAMHSA and participates in the NAS subcommittee of the Kansas Opioid and Prescription Drug Advisory Committee. Um, I also want to just take a minute and mention something that's happened recently that I think is pretty exciting. But uh, earlier this year, um, SAMHSA issued an expansion grant for certified community behavioral health clinics. Um, there was a lot of interest from the CMHCs here in Kansas in applying for that. I think I probably had something like 18 to 20 of the 26 CMHCs that applied for this. Um, and this year, Kansas, I'm proud to say, was able to join 32 other states in working on this model. So four county mental health center in Independence, Kansas, received a grant award of $2 million for um, Southeast and South Central Kansas counties. Um, and they're going to also include a focus on serving service members, veterans, and their families. They're anticipating being able to serve about 6,500 people a year. And um, they also are um, looking to figure out um, how we can work with National Council um, and their CCBHC Success Center uh, to get implementation support for um, the state um, to look at how we might be able to expand CCBHC in Kansas. Um, I think that we are going to need a state plan amendment in order to do that, um, but we will continue to look at what options we have for that as we move forward with modernization. And then finally, for um, our fiscal year 21 strategic goals for KDADS, um, these are just next steps um, for my commission and what I'm hoping to, to focus on. These are kind of my top 10 uh, goals for next year. Uh, which is identifying a vendor and launching the new Hayes Children's Psychiatric Hospital Project, uh, recruiting regional hospitals to participate in the State Institute Alternatives Project, completing new and updated regulations for PRTFs, crisis intervention centers, and private psychiatric hospitals, continuing to work on lifting the moratorium at Osawatomie State Hospital, completing the mental health IMD exclusion implementation and evaluation plans for CMS approval, further reducing the MCO PRTF admissions wait list and reducing continued stays in NFMHs. Uh, then we've got increasing options for supported employment and supported housing and assistance of care. Again, these are both um, social determinants of health. Um, they are things that are needed by our populations that we serve in order to be successful in the community. Um, and so we're continuing to look at ways we can do that. We're fully implementing the Kansas Stepping Up Initiative TA Center. Um, this is another opportunity that I'm very excited about. Um, we were gonna be working with the Council of State Governments Justice Center in order to try and um, be the second state in the country to have a state specific TA center for this initiative. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, this is very much focused on um, sort of pre-trial, um, pre-jail diversions um, and other programs that can be established at a local level. So we'll set this TA center up this year um, and hopefully serve um, several counties around the state in um, supporting their um, stepping up initiatives. We do have also the largest number of um, counties in any one state that have met their exemplar standards um, for stepping up initiative and I'm, I'm very proud of the counties that have done that and the work that they're doing to make that happen at the local level. And then for number nine, we're going to create and establish a state suicide prevention coalition. 
Um, this has been something that has been important to the infrastructure of the state around prevention of suicide um, for some time. Um, and we've been working on trying to make it a reality. And number 10 is we'd like to hire a suicide prevention coordinator, a housing coordinator, and an employment coordinator. Um, those positions um, are outlined in our strategic planning document. Um, and it's important, I think, for us to have people in those roles in order to be able to focus full time on those issues. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation and stand for any questions. Are there questions for Andy? Uh, Chairwoman Landwehr, this is Denise Sisman. If I may, I do have a question for the commissioner. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so commissioner, I just wanna say first off, as a member of the mental health task force, this uh, the amount of work that, that KDADS has done to help to implement their, our recommendation has been substantial and impressive. And I found that during the entire task force uh, discussions and meetings that you all were a strong partner and you've continued to show that. So I did wanna express my thanks and gratitude. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily a question, but I have a recommendation related to uh, something that you had mentioned on slide 19 which is um, that KDADS is intending to work with DCF, KDOC, and the Association of Community Mental Health Centers of Kansas to explore the CMHC model or role in serving crossover youth and their need with regard to capacity building. Uh, my recommendation would be to also include um, the Community Care Network of Kansas to represent the federally qualified health centers um, I know that there are recommendations both in the mental health task force as well as in the DCF report that talk about the importance of integrated care and that's been mentioned a few times already today as uh, necessary or as an, uh, an important part of modernization and we'd love to be part of that discussion. Uh, federally health, qualified health centers do uh, provide both behavioral health and primary care services to children who are served in the foster care system. And we'd love to be able to help think through some solutions for that. Yeah, Denise, I'll make sure you get invited to some meetings. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else with questions for Andy? All right, seeing none, what we're going to do now is we're going to, oh, wait a minute. I believe we've got Senator McGinn is waving at. Oh, Senator Petty has the question. Okay. The audio is not coming through. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't realize we were muted. Can you oh, hear me? There we go. All right. Thank All you. Right. Uh, this is on page nine uh, of the report under the Children's Continuum of Care. And um, when you mentioned about uh, the uh, ACES training, um, I'm just, uh, I was wondering. Uh, if you could expand on how much that has been uh, funded and has been used. Yeah, um, I don't know that I've got specific funding information available to me right now, but um, it's not a significant uh, investment at this point. Um, I think that there's still plenty of room for us to do more training on ACEs with providers, um, especially um, when we're looking at integration with primary care. Um, ACEs is a fairly um, familiar uh, screen for anybody that's working in behavioral health um, to just check for kids that are experiencing trauma from early childhood experiences. Um, but I think it's a little bit less common in primary care. Um, and so if we're looking at how to modernize, um, I feel like there's still plenty of room for us to do more training for primary care folks. 
Thank you, I would totally agree. And then on that same page, um, you, uh, when you talked about the Juvenile Crisis Intervention Center, are you talking about the one in Johnson County? I mean, are the potentially one in Johnson County? Um, so I believe Johnson County submitted a bid two years ago. Um, and I think there is, you know, the potential of us doing something in Johnson County in the future. Um, right now, we don't have any current RFP out with any particular bidders. Okay, so there's no current. So that's right. is that the only RFP that was received originally. Uh, but yeah, so we we received one bid in um, from from DC, you know, from the DCF uh, RFP, and I think we've received one bid from the KDADS RFP, but neither one of those were awarded. No, so we currently, we currently do not have a JCIC in Kansas. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, made a, I made a note for the, on page 11, uh, when you had the K, KDES has approved for a, the 1115 MD exclusion demonstration waiver, I guess I, I didn't write any notes there. Uh, uh, is that been implemented or is that in the process? Yeah. So the so the SUD um, mental the SUD IMD exclusion has entered the implementation phase, and we are implementing it. The mental health IMD exclusion waiver is still being written, right? So we're still working on the implementation plan and the evaluation plan that needs CMS approval in order for us to move forward with it. Um, and so I I would anticipate that it'll probably be another. Um, six to nine months before we have approval from CMS on that. And then my last question was on page 19 um, under the crossover youth uh, working group final report. And the uh, number four was one of the largest barriers to services placement instability. Is that placement in, could you expand on that? Yeah, so, so that refers to the actual placement of the foster care youth. Um, so if they are in a foster home or if they're in a, um, uh, a different type of facility, oftentimes they might be moving around the state and those in, that instability is what that refers to. So if um, kids are moving around from county to county, it's very difficult for the CMHCs and for the school districts to maintain behavioral health services for those children, um, which is part of the reason we try to develop the universal services jacket in order to help their um, behavioral health records move with them as they move across the state. Um, I think there has been some improvement um, in the instability of placements over the last year and a half, um, but I think it still remains an issue for some children. And lastly, of those four items there, I know number three said the passage of Senate Bill 367 has limited the authority of the law enforcement to place youth in detention. I I mean, that was a key point of Senate Bill 367 of not having crossover youth in detention. Is this a recommendation that they be that, that be changed? Well, I think Randy spoke to this pretty well earlier when he was doing the report out on um, this morning. Um, and I, I think he probably has more information about it than I do, but I feel like it's not necessarily that it's a recommendation, but we do have a gap in the system, right? So children that used to be placed in detention by law enforcement agencies in order to give their families a break in the midst of a crisis or for the safety of their own youth or to prevent runaway situations from occurring, um, those things are no longer available to law enforcement as a tool. So now they either have to put charges on the child or they have to um, leave the child in the house with the parents. And so that I think is the primary concern that Randy cited is that um, right now without a juvenile crisis intervention center in place um, or some other type of facility that can receive these children, um, the fact that law enforcement no longer has the ability to detain children for their own protection, um, has been a, a concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Petty, I might add, it's, you know, in my discussions with uh, law enforcement and some of the facilities that have been trying to handle these kids is that we realize that we have 
come across a group of kids, as you heard Andy just talk about, that are either a danger to themselves or potentially a danger to others. So it's trying to find that happy medium because yes, we, we, want, all, we want kids to try to not be under the governance of law enforcement, but there are some kids that do need that detention to protect themselves and to protect others. So we're trying, I think the, the goal now is, is trying to figure out what is that, what does that look like and how do we do it to still stay true to where we've tried to move these children. And th there have been some very um, interesting things that some local um, communities have done to try and address that issue. Um, so if we can find ways to um, maybe scale those up at a state level, that might be helpful. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, what, what oftentimes is needed most is an opportunity for respite so that the, the families can have a break and the children can calm down, the parents can calm down. Um, and there's an opportunity for the CMHCs then to step in and provide some services um, and hopefully change some behaviors. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Representative Armberger. I have a quick question. Um, on slide 25 and bullet point 10, where it says hire, hire a suicide prevention coordinator, there already is one with the Attorney General's office. I'm curious if you're wanting to move that over to KDADS or if KDADS wants one as well, um, do we need two? And kind of if you could elaborate on that. Sure, so um, the Attorney General office does have a part-time youth suicide prevention coordinator. So she works part-time and she's focused on youth suicide prevention only. Um, I'd like to have a full-time state suicide prevention coordinator that would allow for us to focus on things like veteran suicide, um, adult suicide, and also looking at zero suicide uh, implementation around the state. Um, KDHE is also very involved as an agency in suicide prevention. We work very closely with all three agencies, the Attorney General's Office, KDHE, and KDADS on youth suicide prevention and we coordinate our efforts very closely. Um, we also are, however, very interested in, in the fact that we've recently received um, at KDHE a zero suicide grant that's gonna be working with the CMHC system to try to um, implement those policies and procedures that support um, the zero suicide initiative. So there's a lot that's happening with um, suicide in the state. However, we lack a lot of really key infrastructure pieces. Um, we do not have um, sort of a defined uh, state suicide budget or a state suicide organization that uh, receives funding from the state for suicide prevention specifically. Um, I think that by developing a statewide coalition, um, that will be a key implement in trying to provide coordination of those services and also building infrastructure throughout the state. And I think that that needs to be supported by a full-time position um, at a state agency. So one quick follow-up, do you feel as if um, one agency should have just one uh, suicide prevention coordinator? Or do you think that it's beneficial if KDAG had one and then attorney general's office has their part-time youth and maybe if DCF wanted one, I mean, or do you think it all should be combined underneath one agency? Um, I, I think it's beneficial for all the agencies to work together. I do think it might be beneficial for a lead agency to be declared so that um, they can sort of um, facilitate all of the discussion and work that's going on around the state. And would you suggest that KDADS be the lead agency? I'd be happy to suggest that, yes. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Andy? Madam Chairman? Yes. Elizabeth Bishop? Representative Bishop. I'd like to ask a question about the issue of uh, hospitalizations and uh, then going back out into the community and needing to have uh, Medicaid services continued in a timely manner. Um, as I understand it, we have a new prod, pro, a program that's been in operation for about a year um, and it's established a network under APRIS and I, sorry, I don't know what APRIS stands for. Okay that includes about 82 counties so far of folks. In other words, the jails are included, 
the hospitals are included and they're in the process of, of uh, making referrals. And as I understand it, about 45,000 unduplicated referrals were made in this last year. But in talking with folks, I get the impression that within the mental health system, they're not quite feeling this as a service going forward. And I would like to know what, what your take on it is. So I, I don't have a lot of information about APRIS um, and the work that's going on uh, with that group. I do feel like um, we oftentimes are, so we utilize um, uh, what's known as SOAR workers, um, which is a, a federal program that's designed to work with people to reconnect them to their social security benefits. And then we utilize those same SOAR workers at each of the CMHCs to try to connect people back to their Medicaid benefits as well. And so when we're looking at, at overall eligibility um, and reconnection to benefits, um, we're, tr we're trying to have a broader scope than just Medicaid um, because we also need to connect them to funding that they can use to help pay rent and other things like that. So. I feel like um, that might be a really good question to ask of um, Kyle or the Association of Community Mental Health Centers of Kansas um, or any of the representatives from the CMHCs that might be on the committee. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Any further questions of Andy? All right, seeing that's none. Thank you, uh, Andy, for presenting for us today. You've given us a lot of uh, I think things to think about and talk about. Uh, at this time here, um, I have been notified that lunch has arrived for legislators and staff that are in the committee room. And for those of you that on Zoom gives you an opportunity to grab something because we are going to have a working lunch so that we can just keep moving along and, and maybe not get into the, the real late part of the day. So we will uh, reconvene here at, uh, let's do 12.18. We're recessed.
Okay, Robin, do you uh, remove the your screen and then we go back to seeing the uh, individuals? <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Are we good, Senator McGinn? Okay, I believe that we can go ahead and uh, reconvene. Everyone's, uh, you know, feel free to go ahead and continue eating your lunch. We don't like to rush anybody on their, their lunch time, but we wanted to get through this so that uh, People did have time to uh, deal with other business for the, the day. <clears throat> so next on our agenda, I believe, do we have uh, KDHE ready or will it be uh, DCF? This is KDHE, we are ready. All right, then uh, I take it that that's Kelsey Torres. It is. All right, welcome to committee. Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, well, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Kelsey Torres, Behavioral Health Consultant at the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. I'm here today to present an overview of the public health initiatives related to behavioral health on behalf of KDAG. Uh, just starting with a brief overview of today's presentation, I'm gonna focus on KDHE's role within the behavioral health continuum of care and provide a really high level overview um, of several of our behavioral health programs and initiatives. Um, talk a lot about collaborations and how we use data to guide programs and workforce development activities. So starting with this idea of integrated um, care across the continuum, we felt it was important to note that biological, psychological, and social factors all impact mental well-being. Uh, behavioral health needs are complicated and require a collaborative cross-sector approach during all phases of the continuum of care. So we're going to take a closer look at that um, behavioral health continuum of care that I'm referencing. The public health approach is the upstream approach. Um, and KDHE primarily focuses on um, the promotion and prevention activities there on the left side of the continuum. Um, this is why collaborations are so important to us. We want to make sure that there's a coordinated system of care in place so we can connect um, the families that we're serving to adequate services across the continuum. So I'm briefly going to touch on a few topics before I go into um, some of the activities that we um, have been facilitating um, within that continuum of care. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight a few of our data collection mechanisms, but this list is some of the normal public health surveillance activities that include a behavioral health component that's managed by KDHE. So the behavioral health um, factor surveillance system is a population-based data um, source with several public health indicators. It includes things like opioid use and other substance use disorders also mental illness and adverse childhood experiences. Uh, the Kansas Violent Death Reporting System compiles de-identified information on violent deaths like suicide. And um, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System or PRAMS is a survey of women who've given birth within the last six months um, and it's used to improve pregnancy related health outcomes. It includes questions around depression, anxiety, and substance use during the pregnancy and postpartum periods. Again, as I've mentioned, collaborations are really important um, to KDHE. We wanna highlight some of the cross-sector partnerships that we have or participate on. Um, 
we wanted to just also thank members of this committee for, for your involvement in creating some of these different task force and work groups. We really appreciate that behavioral health issues are being elevated um, and that we have the opportunity to serve on these different committees. This intentional opportunity to collaborate has really helped improve coordination across our different agencies and avoid duplication of services. Also felt it was important um, to point out that KDAG uses both braided and blended funding strategies to make sure um, that we have funding available to support the behavioral health needs of the families we serve. And of course, sustainability is always a concern, especially when uh, programs are funded by time-limited grant initiatives. So consistent, constant concern, and always an area of focus. So I'm gonna dive into the continuum of care a little bit here, um, starting with promotion initiatives. Um, I think it's important to note that promotion starts over here on the left, but it also continues across the entire continuum. This is just a few of our promotional um, campaigns that we've done over the last year. Starting on the left, um, the Youth Suicide Prevention Interagency Work Group developed a series of youth um, suicide prevention tip sheets. So this is a collaborative group between KDHG, KDADS, the Attorney General's Office, DCF, um, Department of Education, and the Kansas Suicide Prevention Resource Center. So we all came together, compiled information, and developed these tip sheets. So what's here on this slide is the tip sheet intended for youth, but there's also tip sheets for parents, school personnel, and community members. Uh, Can Quit is the Kansas Tobacco Quit Line. They provide free one-on-one -on -one coaching for individuals wanting to quit tobacco use. Moving down from that, um, this is a summary slide of a series of adolescent suicide prevention awareness campaign graphics that the Kansas Maternal and Child Health Council created. This is based off the Be the One Two's Five Steps to Help Save a Life. And those five steps are included on this summary slide. Hope Starts Now is one of our newest promotional activities. It focuses on pregnant and parenting women who are experiencing opioid or other substance use disorders. Um, and the aim is really to connect those individuals with services made available through the parent helpline. And that's our state centralized access point um, for support services for Kansas families. And finally, um, KDHE really promotes um, and works to increase awareness of the prevention lifeline and text line. I also wanna point out this box that's at the lower right-hand corner of the screen. These are included throughout the presentation and indicate how these particular activities align with the various recommendations that came from the committees and work groups. So moving along the continuum to prevention, um, this is really those interventions that occur prior to the onset of the disorder and are focusing on optimizing well-being. Um, so starting with data, um, this is just a few of our data points collected through the Kansas Violent Death Reporting System. Uh, something that really um, jumped out to us with these um, particular data points is the prevalence of intimate partner problems um, for those that have died by suicide. And that's that orange box on this um, graph on the right side of the screen. So I'm gonna talk about a few of our intervention strategies that we're looking to implement um, based off seeing this data. Um, here are just a few other data points around suicide in Kansas. Um, something else that jumped out to us is here at the top um, states three out of 10 females who died by suicide did not have a paid job. Um, and moving to the right side of the screen, of those women who died by suicide um, that were employed at the time of death, the majority um, worked in the healthcare field. The graph on the left is occupational classification for men who have died by suicide. Um, and again, the majority here are really in that agricultural industry, um, working on farm, forestry, and fishing. 
So as you can see, the um, healthcare and agricultural um, occupations were already at high risk. And these are definitely two of the occupational groups that have been impacted the most um, by COVID. So I thought it was important to note that um, a collaboration between KDHE, KDADS, um, Division of Emergency Management and Department of Agriculture came together and submitted a successful application for FEMA's uh, Crisis and Counseling Grant. So this actually allocated um, funding for positions within the Department of Agriculture um, for crisis and um, for crisis counselors. So those are the individuals providing that distress and crisis support um, to those in agricultural um, communities. Just to highlight a few of our other suicide prevention initiatives, um, something that was just uh, published this week is our document, The Role of Public Health in Suicide Prevention. In that report includes some of the um, data points that I just hit on in the previous slides, um, as well as um, lots of other information and details about our programs. Something that we're really excited about, and Andy mentioned this and during his testimony, is that we um, recently received notification um, of the Zero Suicide and Health um, Systems Grant Award. So this really is focusing on a framework for system-wide transformation towards safer suicide care. Um, it has an organizational level focus um, that helps ensure that suicide prevention and risk reduction strategies are included in organizations' policies and practices. There's also a workforce development component to this grant um, to help increase the availability of evidence-based trainings. And this will be done in partnership between KDHE, um, local and state partners, as well as all um, 26 community mental health centers. And I mentioned that data point around intimate partner violence. Um, so we're also concentrating on increasing interventions um, in our programs around this. Um, we're promoting use of the Future Without Violence Cues intervention which is um, evidence-based and is used to address domestic and sexual violence within a healthcare setting. So we're promoting that use within our excuse me, Title V maternal and child health programs, especially as it relates to well woman visits and also our Title X family planning um, programs. So another prevention focus point here um, on ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. These are those childhood experiences of abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. The ACE study results found that as the number of ACEs increases, so do the risks of negative health outcomes. And you can see those health outcomes on the left side of the screen. On the right is a chart outlining some of the system impacts of ACEs. So for those adults that have six or more ACEs, the life expectancy is actually reduced by 20 years. Um, and in reference to the fiscal impact, this doesn't just impact the healthcare system, but there's also um, fiscal impacts to ju or justice, child welfare, um, the workforce and special education. So what this tells us is that there's really a need um, for an upstream preventative approach um, to addressing and changing the trajectory of this. Um, we really wanna focus on protective factors like resiliency and building upon families' um, strengths to reduce their risk. Um, so this slide outlines six of the different strategies um, or programs um, that include a resiliency skill building component uh, our infant and early childhood programs really work um, to focus on implementing these types of programs, um, like home visiting, parent um, training programs, and all of these really focus on um, attachment and belonging, which is a, res excuse me, a resiliency um, factor. So 
So moving to a treatment and case identification, over the past few years, more public health programs are focusing on working um, on increasing patient identification. There's definitely a system need um, to provide an early intervention at, as soon as possible to prevent those crisis episodes. So this is data points on um, the mental health prevalence during pregnancy and postpartum periods. The top part in black is um, just research findings based on national data. The information below the line in blue um, came from the Kansas PRAM survey. So what we found is about 19% of mothers um, in Kansas reported having depression during pregnancy. Of these, 17% felt that they needed treatment and didn't get it. And those bubbles at the bottom um, are some of the reasons that they indicated why they did not um, get treatment services. Um, so this really demonstrates the need to increase identification of mental health conditions during the pregnancy period and improve those referral mechanisms to better support our families. So KDHE programs are uh, recommending universal screening practices to help increase identification. We developed a perinatal mental health integration toolkit um, to help local programs as they're implementing universal screening practices. Um, the toolkit includes things like screening tools, um, suggested workflows, policy templates, and resources. We're also really excited about the success of the Pediatric Supporting Parents Work Group. They recently drafted and submitted a maternal depression impact paper to Medicaid leadership. Um, and earlier this month, Medicaid approved a maternal depression screening policy. So what this means is that Kansas will be joining the 41 other states who allow for maternal depression screenings to be conducted during a well child visit and be billed under the child's Medicaid ID. And that's allowed by CMS just because of all of the um, evidence that shows that parental depression has an adverse impact on the child's social, emotional, and cognitive development. So we're really excited about this and are um, anticipating that this is really gonna help increase the identification of mothers who might be struggling with a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder. I'm gonna look a little bit here at substance use. Um, this is a few of our success stories that came out of recommendations from the different councils and work groups. KDG used these recommendations, especially from the Substance Use Disorder Task Force, to implement new activities and policy changes. Um, we're really excited about the success that we're seeing, especially that second bullet point, um, the decrease of MME being dispensed to patients. Oh. Well, that this is, um, means that we're trending in the right direction and that our substance use programs and workforce development um, opportunities are proving to be successful interventions. This is a few of our initiatives focusing on identification of substance use. Um, again, I've included some of the graphics from our Hope Starts Now marketing campaign. I think it's a great example of how promotional items can be used across the continuum. So not only do we want providers to facilitate universal substance use screenings, but we also want to reach those individuals who might be struggling. Uh, we want to increase their awareness of this chronic disease and let them know it's okay to talk to healthcare providers and other support people about what they might be struggling with. And something that is kind of interesting that came out of the development of this marketing campaign is um, the peer review process. So the um, folks working on the campaign went and met with a group of women who um, were receiving treatment as a substance use residential treatment center. And they provided input on like images and what they thought would work and where they would look for information. And the team went back to work and drafted um, some messages of hope and optimism, positivity, and took those images back to um, the women in the treatment, the women receiving treatment. And um, they got brutally honest feedback. Uh, 
They said that this is overly optimistic. It's not relatable. Um, and that they would never pay attention to such a marketing strategy. So they took that advice and uh, developed these images, which were approved by those women. So I think it really just shows the um, importance of including those with lived experience in our processes. And that's something that KDAG really values. So I do want to thank um, chair and members of this committee for recognizing the importance of this and, and including individuals with lived experience on this committee. I also wanna thank those individuals um, for being vulnerable and sharing your experiences, especially with those in uh, decision-making positions. So thank you. And um, here are a few of our workforce development strategies uh, as it relates to substance use. Most of the uh, recent work came out of KDHE's Overdose to Action um, grant and a high level overview of the strategies and framework of that grant are included in the graphic on the right here. But one of the things they did um, was implement a 10 session project echo series focusing on pain prescribing and substance use disorders. <clears throat> so for those of you that don't know, Project Echo is extension for community health care um, outcomes. It's a telementoring program designed to connect healthcare providers to other healthcare providers and subject matter experts. It was developed with rural communities in mind um, and based on the idea of moving information, not people. I also wanted to touch on a couple workforce development activities that focus on both mental health and substance use. So we know that addressing perinatal behavioral health is much more than just screening. Um, there must be a referral process in place and a coordinated system of care um, to ensure that further assessment and treatment services are available. Um, through this community supporting perinatal behavioral health community collaborative, um, we established several components or standards um, for how local programs can expand their efforts to improve those maternal mental health outcomes in their communities. So some of these standards or components include having a universal screening policy in place, having an MOU with a local uh, mental health or substance use treatment provider, um, and establishing a local system of care that includes both individuals and families with lived experience. There's also a component um, for the development of perinatal mental health support groups within this collaborative. So while the community collaborative is focusing on our um, local maternal and child health programs, our Kansas Connecting Communities grant is focusing on healthcare providers and carrying out those same objectives. So also through that grant, um, we were able to establish a provider consultation line. Um, this is available to both healthcare and social service providers and is a free service for them. Um, so those individuals can contact um, consultation line staff if they have questions about um, the next steps following a screen or if they need help identifying patient resources or um, referral options. There's also a provider to provider consultation option. So there is a psychiatrist on staff who has training in perinatal mental health who can help um, local treatment providers with diagnosing or best prescribing practices um, and considerations that need to be made um, when treating pregnant and postpartum women. Here are a few other workforce development activities that we make available um, to both the social service and healthcare providers. Um, these have that case identification yeah and our early intervention component within them. So the final phase that I will touch on is um, standard treatment. So as I previously mentioned, treatment typically falls within KDAD's role within the continuum of care, um, but we do have a pediatric mental health care grant um, focusing on first line treatment. So I'll share some of that information. As you all likely are aware, um, the majority of our counties, 99 out of 105, 
our designated mental health care professional shortage areas. So the Kansas Kids Map grant focuses on increasing mental health expertise for primary care providers like pediatricians and family physicians and supporting them in the treatment of non-complex behavioral health conditions. Um, again, for pediatric settings, so our children and adolescents. Um, so to ensure that primary care providers are following best treatment practices and guidelines, we established a pediatric mental health care team. This team includes a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist, psychologist, a pediatrician, and a social worker. Um, so primary care providers across the state can contact the team either through the consultation line or through the um, teleecho clinics made available through this grant. So the teleecho clinic um, is similar to Project Echo, but the clinic is ongoing opposed to just a few sessions. And since this is outside of the usual role um, for KDHG, we wanted to be really intentional in our collaborations with KDADS. Um, we also wanted to align with the behavioral health treatment system. So we contacted KDADS and the Governor's Behavioral Health Services Planning Council and their children's subcommittee is serving as the advisory council for the Kansas Kids Map Grant. Um, so KDHG was awarded this grant July of last year. The first five months or so were spent building infrastructure um, and the consultation line had a soft launch in December, 2019, um, fully launching in uh, January, 2020. So that's really when um, program outreach to promote uh, the support services offered and provider recruitment started. And this map shows the number and locations of the primary care providers who enrolled in the program within that seven months of service delivery. So from December to June, so the first year of this grant award. The table on the right shows a breakdown of um, those enrolled by provider type. Um, and as I mentioned, this grant also established a provider consultation line. Um, so when an enrolled primary care provider um, calls or emails the consultation line, the social worker provides the initial response. If a case consultation is needed, she coordinates this with the other members of the pediatric mental health care team. Um, and everyone weighs in on the case, each bringing a different perspective based off of their area of expertise. What we found is this multidisciplinary approach has really contributed to um, very thorough recommendations to those primary care providers and has helped increase um, satisfaction with the services offered. Um, since the soft launch of the consultation line in December, 34 different primary care physicians uh, made 126 inquiries to the consultation line. What we found to be interesting is um, the highest reason for contacting the consultation line is wellness resources. And this is, this is interesting because it's physician wellness resources. So it's those enrolled primary care providers who might be dealing with increase in stress, feeling overwhelmed, um, or struggling with their own mental well-being, seeking some support. So our team works to provide that and some uh, resources and information to them. And then just to summarize here, um, KDHG follows the public health upstream approach and focuses efforts on mostly those promotion and prevention activities. We collaborate with local and state partners to ensure that individuals and families have the services they need um, and care and treatment is available across the continuum. So thank you for allowing me to present today and I can turn it over for questions. Madam Chair, this is Senator McGann. Can you hear me? Here, she's not turned on yet. She's muted. I can hear you, Senator McGann. I don't know about- Yeah, I know. I, our, chair, our chair is muted. That's why we can't hear her. Um, there she goes. Madam yeah. Chair, may I ask a couple of questions? 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, get back to the front part. On your uh, suicide list on slide 12, I believe, um, it seems kind of interesting to me that, of course, when it's the categories farm forestry fishing, you know, we all know in Kansas, the majority of that is agriculture farming. And it's almost doubled the next category. I looked on the KDA website, it said that they are doing some things in coordination with Department of Ag. I'd like to know what specifically they're doing. Um, I, I pulled up one document that the governor has received some FEMA money, uh, but I don't see anything that's specifically helping um, Kansas agriculture in that area. Could you give a little more information as to what entities are involved in providing some of that help? Yeah, I know um, in the application, we outlined that the um, Department of Agriculture and um, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center here in Kansas, we're going to help provide some of those crisis services. Um, that grant is being administered between the Division of Emergency Management and KDADS, so they would have more of the information of exactly what those activities are looking like um, now that they're in implementation phase. So I can get that information and share that back with the committee. If you would, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then my other question has to do with uh, the kids map. Um, I was just curious in on the, there we go, slide 26. Um, of these, <laughs> physician, nurse practitioners, et cetera, and, and maybe you said this and I didn't catch it. Are they physically in those areas or is any of that telemedicine? Um, that is a great question. We do track those that provide telemedicine, but this is their physical location and the communities that they are designated to serve. So we recognize that, especially in our rural and frontier areas, um, you're serving more than one county. So this map kind of reflects that. So if we were able through the CARES Act and some of the work that the SPARC team's doing to expand connectivity and broadband that we could perhaps uh, improve on this in these areas out in the rural areas. Absolutely. And that is going to be um, a priority and a focus area of this grant. So absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chairman. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Kirshen's on his way up. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Kelsey, for your presentation on depression and with the, with the work you're doing. My question is really different topic, I mean, uh, same topic, but dealing with nursing homes with the epidemic we have right now. Dan, you got to talk in the mic. That, uh, <clears throat> oh. Okay. Okay. Now I got it. My uh, question concerns the nursing homes and the assisted living situation where they're quarantined and their families can't get come in contact. You can't even give them a package. And we are hearing there is major depression going on in the senior citizens. And there's probably no, there's no treatment because you can't come in contact with them. But so the only thing I know is that maybe that KDHE or KDADS to look at those regulations that allow some kind of outside time or something, because even the staff are saying that the family members are angry and everybody's in a bad mood because they can't see their loved ones, their senior citizens, and, there's, and they're, they're suffering from depression because they won't even talk, they don't eat. And I suppose this is a new area, area of depression maybe or something like that, but at least is there any awareness that there's a possibility that could be looked into or made a possibility of treating people who are in those conditions, because there's definitely a problem with the epidemic that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is one of the, the good things that has come out of COVID is the expansion of um, where the patient location can be um, for receiving services by telehealth. Um, I don't know about nursing home um, or assisted living 
locations, but we can definitely connect with um, our leadership team and Medicaid authorities to, to see what, um, what options those particular um, individuals have for receiving mental health treatment. Certainly, because they're definitely, it's a new area, but uh, but how do you treat somebody you can't even look at or hardly see? Yeah. You can't be even package. So anyway, that's just some ideas that's going to be coming in the future. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Are there fur further questions by committee members? Oh, that looks like yeah. Representative Lynn. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Representative Lynn. I have a couple questions, if I may. Um, on the promotions on slide number nine, I was curious to know if you have um, a promotion available for peer-to-peer uh, -peer best practices, specifically for middle schoolers, um, also for high schoolers, and then potentially elementary as well, but um, something that maybe can be put in the schools or um, something that's just more specific to them. Yeah, the um, Be the One To campaign, we actually created two different series of those graphics. So one um, that the image here is included with like the this boot and the shoe shows that connection between adults and, and um, youth. There's also a series um, that is youth to youth. So that message is more like connect with someone you trust and then connect to um, a trusted adult to get some support services. Um, but I think like having a similar tip sheet to um, this youth one here with some different strategies and that could be helpful to, especially in the middle school population. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then to go along with that, you mentioned on page 15 about the parenting training programs and then uh, a, a best practices for parents to start that conversation at a younger age um, how we can best communicate with our children to look for the warning signs, you know, even at age of 10. And um, unfortunately we have to go that low. Um, if there, what kind of parenting training program do you have? Yeah, we have several. Um, one is our becoming a mom classes. Um, so those are for pregnant and um, there's a few classes that occur in the postpartum period. Um, something else I didn't include in the presentation just because of time is some of the infrastructure um, work going into um, our infant and toddler services. And this is made available through that early childhood um, work that's happening across the state. So what's happening is the um, Part C infant toddler programs are um, helping implement um, social and emotional, well, it's the ages and stages questionnaire, um, the social and emotional development guide. Um, so they are becoming enterprises um, or account holders. And what they can do then is see different, um, how much screening is happening on those social and emotional development um, questionnaires and track what gaps are happening within their community. They can also help streamline and make sure that those families who might be noticing some sort of delay get connected to services or further evaluation. Um, so that way that that intervention can happen much earlier on and much more seamlessly. Okay, thank you. I would, I would encourage some, um, even beyond the infant toddler ages, just because I mean, as parents, we tend to kind of like, okay, I got this once we get past that toddler age, but then we forget to, you know, check in with our kids as they're getting older. So thank you. Yeah, we also um, are creating or have created, just need to publish our um, social and emotional development milestone cards. So similar to our developmental milestones, um, we've included some um, di different social and emotional like peaks of where they should be at at different ages in their life. Um, so those cards will be made available to our programs to make available to families, um, hopefully this fall. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, Kelsey, thank you very much for presenting today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. You're welcome. Next up, we have Secretary no, Laura Howard. No, another one. Senator Petty. Oh, Senator Petty has a question. 
we have this transition period. You're going to have to put I'm a little lag. Sure, you know. I was in a line. Okay. You have to let the, uh, the passage to... of uh, Madam Chair, we've got to go to one spot. You know. I know. I was trying to watch the room and I didn't see someone moving, so I apologize. So that when the vice chair says get in line, then you can't see the line. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at page uh, 18 of the report, and um, it dealt with the uh, treatment of case identification. And um, when you talked about the uh, screenings, I was I was wondering um, were those screenings being done at, at, at because the I know there is interest of screenings being done at the hospital. Are these screenings being done at the first well check? Yeah, so that's what we're really promoting, and that's built into the. Um, AAP Bright Futures guidelines that the state recommends um, to pediatric providers. So that's our hope is that those screenings are occurring. Um, we'll be able to track um, a little bit more, hopefully the utilization and the actual number of screens being completed. But, um, there's a reimbursement mechanism for those screens. Um, but yeah, we promote universal screenings both prenatally and postpartum. But uh, that so are we talking about at the doctor's office or after delivery? Um, at the doctor's office, beyond, like during that postpartum period. So really, when I when I reference postpartum period, I'm talking about the time of delivery to 12 months post delivery. Um, so those screens can occur within that time frame. Um, onset of postpartum depression is really more at like that two months from delivery mark or six weeks from delivery mark. Um, so having that screen at the hospital or follow-up appointment is really great. It's a great way to, to get something um, identified, but it does need to extend beyond that. And as KDHE also, when it comes to providing um, parenting um, assistance, working with some of our other programs in the state, like Parents as Teachers? Absolutely, yeah, those efforts are coordinated. They're actually planning a um, home visiting conference that includes all of the different um, programs that will happen next month. Thank you. Are there any further questions? All right. Seeing that again, thank you very much, Kelsey, for participating with us today. And uh, now we will have uh, Secretary Laura Howard from the Department of Children and Families present. Welcome to the committee, Secretary. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm, um, I'm glad to be here today. Um, you know, if I might, before I get into the DCF response to the specific committee reports, I did want to respond just briefly to a couple of the questions related to KDADS that came up during Kelsey's presentation. Um, I think first um, related to Senator McGinn's question related to the agricultural community, uh, depression, suicide prevention. You know, in addition to um, what Kelsey was already referring to with regard to some of the um, the FEMA crisis response. Um, we just recently learned this week at KDADS that we'll have the opportunity to apply for some additional federal funding from SAMHSA that actually goes back to the flooding and disasters from the last year. And a huge amount of focus of that resource should we be successful. And, and I think we will be because um, they essentially asked states to apply for those resources who had significant um, natural disasters last year would, would certainly be focused on the agricultural community. So again, we're, we're excited about that possibility. Um, also on the, the question from Senator Kirshen related to nursing facilities, obviously huge critical issue with the level of isolation. I would let this committee know that we were able as an agency um, to help um, facilities through disseminating additional um, 
devices, both for the standpoint of increasing visitation, but also increasing uh, telehealth opportunities. And we also work with some of the area agencies on aging as well in some locations of the state um, for family members who might not have their own access that they could work with them to do that. Um, but I do think um, on the visitation side, we recently conducted a, a survey to see where facilities are at, um, how creative are they being, are they thinking about ways to do um, outdoor visiting and the like, but, but clearly with some new guidance that will really ramp up testing in nursing facilities, um, we think that will clearly be the, the thing that provides then, you know, the pathway um, to, to opening up um, further visitation. But again, um, a little bit aside from this conversation today, but I did want to give those updates. Um, so I wanted to talk today about how DCF has responded to the various reports that, that you've heard about. Um, obviously, a lot of this will relate to um, the child welfare side of, of DCF. So I'm going to first talk about the Legislative Mental Health Task Force reports. Um, um, the first, and you have a, should have a document from, um, from DCF that's labeled uh, Committee on Kansas Mental Health Modernization and Reform, DCF Response to Mental Health Recommendations. It's in a chart-like form, um, so we talk about the recommendation in the left-hand column and then the action steps that we've taken um, in the right-hand column. Um, um, the first um, area um, within the mental health task force report has to do with access to effective practices and supports. Um, the recommendation specifically referred to uh, the delivery of crisis and prevention services um, in natural settings. Um, so some of the DCF actions, uh, one, has to do with just really supporting the mental health in schools project and really working hard with our contractors on the child welfare side um, to amplify their work to assure that we're getting um, youth within the child welfare system um, referred to those services um, more often. Um, the second area, I think you've already heard this alluded to a couple of times today, has to do with uh, mobile youth crisis. Uh, we're, we were very excited at DCF to receive some um, family first transition funds, some additional dollars that were sent out to states um, around the time that COVID hit. And um, we partnered across uh, DCF and KDADS to develop a bid request for a mobile youth response. We're calling it the Kansas Family Crisis Response and Support. This would provide crisis intervention services for youth 24 seven across the state um, through a mobile response process. Um, and again, this would not just serve foster youth, but all youth. Um, the funding source came um, from a DCF source. So that's why we issued the RFP at DCF. So those um, that bid process is in process right now. Um, it closed um, a, a week or so ago. And so I hope to have some good news to report to this committee by the time of your, of your next meeting about that. Um, the, the next area in terms of access to effective practices and support from the DCF side is obviously the implementation of the Family First Prevention Services Act. I think those of you um, who, who know about um, those services know that this was really a new funding opportunity for states to be able to invest um, federal matching child welfare dollars into front end preventative services. Um, really a game changer as it relates to um, really um, supporting um, families uh, before um, a child would need to enter um, into out of home care. We were an early adopter state. We jumped on it the first time that we could. And for the standpoint of this recommendation, I think what I might focus on the most is that one of the categories within the, the family first, um, it has to do with um, in-home skill building. Another had to do with mental health supports. Um, we were able to uh, award grants to provide parent skill building in all counties of the state. Um, and then a number of grants related to mental health supports for youth and families. I, I list a, a few of those evidence-based practices. 
I think you heard a couple of the other conferees mention the importance of a couple of these like multi-systemic therapy, functional family therapy um, earlier today. Um, so again, um, you know, providing those additional supports and using existing partners across the state. Um, um, I would also um, just mention under this item, um, also in partnership with KDHE, some of the additional um, layer of service coordination that some of the youth in foster care receive through the managed care organizations um, to address um, those particular circumstances where there's some particular mental health or, or physical health issues. Um, the, the second update as it relates to expanding service options um, coming from the, men the Mental Health Task Force report, um, talked about creating additional options such as therapeutic foster care, home-based family therapy, and others. Um, the, the first um, thing that we've, that we've stood up in the last um, year um, has been qualified residential treatment programs. Um, this also is a facet of family first, um, but through this new model, um, a number of our existing um, group homes um, became qualified residential treatment programs. Um, there are certain requirements to be um, trauma-informed, to have certain kinds of treatment services there. Um, and so we were able to stand that up and have um, you know, almost 200 beds across the state um, in terms of these new QRTPs. Um, the other piece in terms of additional options that I think is really important, that we expanded the placement array, um, both for family foster care and for relative foster care, um, so that the, the rates of uh, payment that we would make to providers would allow the development of more specialized homes, both in the, both with regard to um, family foster homes and with regard to relative placements. Um, and then I might also note that um, we have a diligent recruiting plan that's in place each year related to the recruitment of foster homes. And right now we're prioritizing um, foster home retention and respite homes to serve both older youth and those who have high acuity needs. In the area of early intervention, um, increasing access to early childhood mental health services. Again, you'll, you'll see me mention um, Family First quite a bit, um, but again, um, standing up parent skill building services across the state, um, so, um, including, um, including parents as teachers, um, other home visiting programs. Uh, we were able to fund um, the ABC program in 22 counties across the state through a Family First grant as well. Um, and then one thing I don't actually have on my document, but I think it's important to mess it to mention, not as something that we've achieved, but that I think we need to continue to focus on. The recommendation from the mental health task force had to do with expanding um, access through through Medicaid for early childhood mental health services. And I, it, it's been really interesting to learn when we were standing up family first that a number of states that chose not to move forward with Family First, chose not to do that because they were already um, funding things like home visiting services as part of their Medicaid service package. Um, and, and I had the chance, and I'm not sure if any members of this committee were on this trip last year, um, that the United Methodist Health Fund um, sponsored for a number of us to go to North Carolina and look at kind of their um, early childhood system. And part of that focus was on um, early childhood mental health. And again, they're a state that's done some really creative things um, with, their, um, with their managed care program in Medicaid. So again, I just call that out as something I probably would have brought up later when we're actually um, in some roundtable conversations, but it does, it does relate to to this recommendation. And uh, Lee Norman and I have had some conversations about that as it relates to the future of can care. Um, so, so those are some quick updates related to DCF and, and the mental health task force recommendations. Um, with regard to the governor's substance use disorder task force, um, I would mention that um, as part of the Family First grants, we were able to issue um, substance use disorder grants um, related to the child welfare system um, to three providers across the state. Um, not as many um, 
proposals came in on the substance use side as I would like to see. Um, I think we still have a lot of progress to make there. Um, obviously, it's a critical issue when we think about um, preventing youth from coming into custody um, related to issues around substance use. Um, the next area I wanted to mention had to do with the Governor's Behavioral Services Planning Council Children's Subcommittee. Um, as it relates to um, DCF. Um, one of the recommendations was that state agencies invest uh, resources to increase the direct training and support of parents in the care of their children. And one of the things that we've worked with across our foster care and family preservation providers is to implement what's called um, the Kansas Parent Management Training Model. Um, this is a this is a model out of the state of Oregon. It's an evidence based um, intervention that really um, trains parents in really behavioral based interventions to manage difficult behaviors of children and youth. So and we're really excited about um, infusing that um, with our foster care and our family um, preservation grantees. Um, the second area with, um, in terms of the Governor's Behavioral Services Planning Council, um, again, the recommendation is really about implementation of trauma-informed practices. Um, and we've, we've um, implemented a number of practice models in our child welfare system, including family finding, which is really an engagement and family meeting model um, when, anytime there's a barrier to stability or legal permanency. So again, um, two or three very specific uh, trauma-informed models um, that are really focused on, um, you know, really bringing families and those who care more about children, about the child to the table earlier. On page uh, four of my testimony, um, you also have some responses related to the Child Welfare System Task Force. There were a lot of recommendations from the task force, and I think I just reported an update on those to the Foster Care Oversight Committee yesterday. Um, for today's um, purposes, I'm going to focus on those that relate um, to um, behavioral health. Um, so the first, um, I, again, I, I'll, I'll skip this, but really it's the Families First Act again, a recommendation to fund and institute that. Again, we were one of the first five states in the nation to implement it on um, the first day it was available to, to go live. Um, second, in terms of access to care, um, really looking at that issue of medical and behavioral health coordination, particularly for high risk youth in the foster care system. And we've, we, we've taken a number of steps. This is a really high priority area within DCF. Um, the, the first is um, just reor doing some reorganization within our agency itself. We had always had a Medicaid liaison position, um, but we felt like we needed to bring in some more um, expertise um, to DCF itself. And so we've recently hired um, a new director for Medicaid and behavioral health and, and uh, hired an individual um, who had been playing a similar role um, um, for Aetna Better Health. And we're very excited about that. Um, I already talked about the, the mobile youth crisis response, um, that bid that's out there and the mental health in schools. Um, a couple of other things. Um, we continue to work closely really across DCF, KDHE, and KDADS um, to address um, the high, high need youth, bi-weekly meetings, very, very case-specific plannings um, with the managed care organizations in every other meeting. Um, and then another, another step that we implemented um, last fall um, was working with the uh, Kansas um, Academy of Pediatrics uh, um, really to implement a medical history form um, for youth coming into the foster care system. Um, again, to make it more, make it easier to have that information. The, the next area in the um, child welfare task force report I wanted to highlight has to do with reentry and transitional services. Um, and again, and, and, and part of that being ensuring continuity um, with medical and behavioral health. So I've, I've just given you an update there on just the resources that we target through um, 
through our independent living program at DCF um, to make sure that children are linked up. And of course they're able to, and of course they're able to maintain that, that medical card as they age out of foster care, eligible for can care until their 26th birthday. And so we, we um, work closely actually across DCF KDADS and KDHE to make those transitions smooth. Um, you know, the last item, um, well, actually, I, on page six, um, related to service settings, I know I think I've, I've really covered these um, already um, with regard to other items, family first, the placement arrays, and some things like that. So I'm going to move on to item 11 on um, page seven from the Child Welfare Task Force recommendation, which had to do with um, fully funding and strengthening and expanding safety net and early childhood programs. Um, again, the family first, uh, the extent of new home visitation grants. Um, we have a home visitation grant with KCSL using the Healthy Families America approach. Um, we also were able this year to increase the rates for infant toddler child care to the 85th percentile. That's a very important family strengthening program in, in terms of making um, child care more accessible. And then I would be remiss if I um, if I ever spoke and just and didn't continue to talk about our efforts to continue to um, enhance our safety net programs around SNAP and TANF um, and some of the limitations that are in place in Kansas. So you'll continue to hear us um, make some advocacy in that regard. We appreciated the legislature um, providing us some limited authority for a year through a proviso on the SNAP side. And that's really proven to be incredibly beneficial during this time of, of this pandemic and the economic downturn in the state. Um, let me move on to the uh, crossover youth working group. I'm on page seven and um, eight. Um, again, the first one having to do with placement stability and geography, um, the, the crisis response grant. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight on the placement stability side. Um, we have an internal DCF placement stability work team that's been formed um, with um, representatives from our regional offices, from our contractors, um, really looking at innovations to placement stability. You know, we still have a ways to go, um, but I'm really, really pleased to see that the data is moving in the right direction. Um, we see a really strong downward trend in terms of the numbers number of placement changes that youth are having. Um, so we're, we're excited about that, but not satisfied. I mean, I think would be a good way to say that. Um, um, page eight, uh, parental and family involvement. I already talked about the PMTO model um, and mentioned um, the family finding um, practice approach. Now, uh, really key with crossover youth, um, obviously crossover youth, um, been a real challenge um, in the child welfare system. And, and as a system, um, the child welfare system has really had to learn how to best serve these youth. So again, highlighting those two pieces I had referred, I had referred to earlier. Um, I'm gonna skip down to the 2020 crossover youth working group um, to not be too repetitive on the bottom of page eight. Um, one of the recommendations in the 2020 crossover um, group had to do with um, children on the SED waiver in the child welfare system, um, making sure there's consistent assessment. Um, so we, we've been doing a couple things um, over the last year. One, I'm trying to make sure those youth who enter foster care on the SED waiver are able to keep it and transfer it to another CMHC um, should the child move out of their catchment area. Um, I think there's been really good work done across the agencies and with the community mental health centers to improve that considerably in the last year. Um, and then I also would mention just the work um, that's been done that Commissioner Brown alluded to earlier related to PRTS and um, really um, not just the work of expanding uh, capacity in the system, which has been incredibly important, but also the cross agency hard work that's done every week um, between KD, uh, between KDADS, DCF, the MCOs, um, really looking at um, the needs of each child and assuring that that folks are work moving through the waiting list on a timely manner. 
think the last item had to do with placements, and I think those are all things I've I've covered um, in in other areas. So I'd be happy, um, Madam Chair, to stand for any questions from the DCF perspective or the KDAT's perspective, from that matter. Committee, are there questions, or even with our uh, Zoom members as well? Got it. Yeah. I don't know why that thing didn't move our screen. Yeah, I wonder if Robin can do that. I'll go see. I want to see if Robin. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Penn. Thank you, um, Secretary. Thank you for uh, being here, and I'm looking back at um, the area on early, early intervention and um, um, I, I wondered if you could expand a little bit about when you talked about ABC and then also it's, uh, you mentioned um, providing funding that you're working with parents as teachers, but uh, am I correct that you're providing funding for extended training for the parents as teacher staff who are providing ABC uh, intervention. Is this correct? A couple, a couple different things, Senator. Um, one, through, fam through our Family First grant awards, um, and one of the categories had to do with parent skill building, um, we have funded um, parents as teachers as one of the family first um, services. Um, we also have funded um, the ABC program in 22 counties. Um, we are doing some additional training um, with parents as teachers, um, but, but we also have funded those as grantees in Families First to provide specific services to the, the families that we refer through Families First, which are families who are at imminent risk of their, their um their fam their child coming into custody. So, so it's both an expansion of those services in the state as well as the training component that you referred to. Thank you. So, because that means in those 22 counties, then some of those, some of the parents as teacher staff has had this extended training for ABC. Is that correct? No, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, if, if I've been, if I was confused, if I was confusing on that. I mean, those, those are separate grants. I mean, so we made, we made grants to fund the ABC program in 22 counties across the state. Um, and then we also made grants to parents as teachers to fund additional parent as, as teacher services across the state. And there are some specific training things just related to foster care connected to parents as teachers. I apologize for that confusion. I think it's my confusion. So I thought in some of those counties though, parents as teacher staff were providing some of those ABC, some uh, that they were doing some of the ABC intervention. That's not correct? There are a couple of parents as teachers programs that also as part of their modality, they are doing ABC interventions, not specifically connected to, to our grants to them, um, but to the broader um, early childhood serving system. Okay, thank you. And I think I had one more. Well, um, oh, I, I wanted to, I just don't wanted to say, I, I think it's an important you brought forward about the issue of the expansion of paying for uh, child care up to 85% uh, is so important so that we can have more child care um, available to our foster care families. And again, that was just for infants and toddlers. Um, I think our, our um, document probably needed to be updated, but that was an important group, I think, to, to make that start. Um, so, I mean, really for all families. Right, it's great for in the right direction. Yeah. 
Are there further uh, questions from the committee members or from any of our Zoom members? All right. Seeing none, we're going to my agenda back up here again. Now we're going to uh, hear from uh, Dale Dennis, the Deputy Commissioner of Education, and he's going to uh, give us measures implemented in response to recommendations and summary of the mental health pilot program. Welcome to committee, Dale. Thank you. The document that I, you have before you, or hope you do, uh, I'll hit some of the high spots on that. And uh, if we go through all of it, I've kind of overdid it on the amount of material we gave you. But on the lower right-hand corner of page two, it's in red. And it says page one. See the one red? That's it. This program was started in 1819, and it was pretty well laid out by that year by the legislature. And it involved really six schools, but it involved, uh, or six districts, but it involved really nine, because one of the districts had a four district consortium. So there was nine districts involved, uh, and one of those districts was a consortium out around Abilene, Harrington, Chapman, in that area. Uh, we also had, uh, through that process, uh, you'll notice the growth in 1920, the number of districts increased to 32, community mental health centers 14, and for 2021, the number of districts is 56, and the number of community mental health centers is 17. And this year, for the first time, if they're willing to cooperate with the community mental health centers, the school district can include other types of uh, mental health centers in their community. There's a few of them around, and there's only three districts that chose to utilize them in cooperation with community mental health centers. This, in the number of buildings served, we start out with 82 in the first year, then 180, and we're up to 232 buildings being served. Uh, and the school liaison people, and we'll talk about these a little bit more in a little bit, but uh, we start out with 45, and then we went to 77, and next year we're up to 103. And we probably can't grow a whole lot faster than that because of the availability of the liaison people. Most of them are uh, uh, master degree social workers, don't have to be. There's a few counselors involved, but uh, the number of people available. Uh, number of students receiving services, 1,708 the first year, 3,266, and we estimate 4,800 the coming year. Uh, if you now can turn to page five in red, the goal uh, is to provide greater access to behavioral health services for school age students with emphasis on young people who are in the custody and receiving services from the, from the Department of Children and Families and establish a coherent structure between schoolers and mental health. And it, it, we're probably growing about at about the right, right rate to provide good service. Uh, just on the side, uh, today I had hooked up a, uh, one of the school liaison people in case you might want to talk to one of them. Had one lined up and she, I don't know if she's going to be available or not. She had a crisis with a student and she didn't know if she'd be able to make it or not. She's all set up and, and, uh, and it's, it's a smaller district. And it's a district that's had some challenges uh, with mental health in their district. Page uh, six. I won't spend a lot of time on this. You can read this rather than watching TV. Uh, we gave you a kind of a, a responsibilities and duties of a school liaison person. They're outlined in page six. Page seven. You'll see the duties of the clinical therapist, which is provided by the mental health centers. And in some cases, in the larger districts, uh, with quite a few students, the mental health center will also assign a case manager. That's to coordinate everything and make sure everything stays on schedule and services are provided. Uh, next, if we can go to uh, page 10. 
I just mentioned this briefly. The legislature set the amount of dollars to begin with for each district the first year, in essence. And we've honored that by since that date and provided them as a grandfather clause. So if they maintain that same service, we didn't take it away from them, even though the formula may have changed a little bit. So they are grandfathered in. And the we pay 75% now this year of the school liaison person and the community mental health center gets 25% of that amount. 25% of that, they get money from other sources and they've been great to work with the mental health centers. And that has not been a, a, a big problem at all. Kyle and company's done a nice job with us. We also uh, just stuck in for free on page 12, uh, the uh, school liaison job description, their responsibilities, and uh, uh, then a, a qualification profile. Most of them are master's degree level social workers, but not necessarily, wouldn't have to be. This next piece on page 14, we're kind of proud of. And uh, we started on this program, we set up an evaluation system and it's computerized and it's updated uh, regularly. And they file a report with us uh, every, uh, each semester. And there's 12 questions that is filled out by the uh, school liaison and mental health providers about the, what they've done and the services and how it's affected the kids. We'll see that here in a minute. Uh, page 16, uh, we just show you kind of a little example of, of the salaries and fringe benefits, whatever the total dollars are, and the mental health providers gets 25% of that amount. And uh, then over on the page 17, we, we, we walked through this in a little bit different than we do some. We did not want to end up at the end of the year with schools having money that they were not, not entitled to. So we, uh, we on page 17, you'll see the school lays on the grant amount, previous payments, remaining balances that we owe them for the year, the cash on hand, the amount of money they need for the next month, and then the total payment requested. And this is computerized to where you never exceed 75%, but you, they draw it down anytime, whenever they need it. When they reach the 75% of that person's salary, that's done. And what happens on occasion, somebody quits, resigns, does whatever, they're gone. That salary amount will change and it could go down, never can go up, but it could go down a little bit because of transition. And if so, that could affect uh, how they draw that down. On page 18, we toss this in for free for the school district to help them out. We think it's a good idea if they have a memorandum of understanding between the school district and the community mental health centers. And they've been super to cooperate. This goes into quite a bit of detail, but that they don't have to use that, uh, that uh, but it's all there available for them. And it, it raises issues and concerns and somebody new they can go through that and pick and choose those things they think would help them. Uh, next, let's take a look at page 27, and this is the peanut of things 27, 8, 9, so forth. On page 27, that's the districts that for uh, be uh, received grants funded for the 2021 school year. You'll see the amount on the first column there with dollars is the amount for school liaisons uh, in their budget. We pay 75% to get 138,750. The state aid they're going to get is, would be the same amount. Uh, the mental health provider will get 25% of that amount than the total state aid. When you go down through there, you may see some where that don't balance out quite as well that's because of the grandfather clause that was the school districts received in the 1819 school year. On the next page, it's a continuation of the same thing, but I want to call your attention to the bottom of page 28. And we're kind of proud of this. Uh, we had six districts in Northwest Kansas got together and submitted an application. And uh, some of you may not be familiar with them. The Quinter was a sponsoring agency 
that involved Grinnell, Wheatland, Oakley, Triplanes. You may know where Triplanes is. Triplanes is Winona. It's just a little way about, it's, it's a little bit east and south of Sharon Springs. It's, it's interesting, they, they don't have, it's very small, but a lot of square miles. Uh, I, think, I think they got like five, 600 square miles in the industry, but it only got about 100 and 215 kids. But anyway, and you, with all those districts listed there are participating in the program, but somebody else is sponsoring district and they do the uh, uh, paperwork that goes with it. And, the, and we've tried to keep that at a minimum. Uh, on the page 29, and this is really the peanut, uh, we listed the district for last year. And the first column is the district served by the Community Mental Health Center. Those re referred for services and intake completed. Uh, that's at the end of the year, you're always gonna have a cutoff. Referred for services intake not completed. Four is improved attendance. This is kind of interesting. Improved attendance after receiving services. Uh, 1135, percentage-wise pretty high. Uh, improved behavior after services is in column five. Column six is improved academics is in column six. That's also those two, all three of those are pretty significant. Number seven, improved internalizing behavior after receiving services. Officially dropping out after receiving services, only 13. Number nine, moving out of the district was 156. We also show the number of students that uh, are, if they know, that are in foster care. That's because that's one of the, the primary purposes of it. But that's kind of a, a simplified report card and the, the system we got for computerizing all that, the school districts liaison people has helped us refine that along with help from the community mental health centers. Uh, on page 30, we do an audit at the end of the year. You don't care about that, probably the steps to the audit and everything we go through to look at, it just audit everything they're supposed to do. And uh, uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions you got. There's a lot more detail in there, but I didn't think that would be appropriate at this time for this committee, but you can look at it. We'll be glad to answer any questions you got. And I will say this, if the school liaison people and the community mental health people involved in this program are very committed, very committed. And uh, I don't know if, if Emily's on or not, but uh, She's one of our uh, school liaison persons, but she, we, did, it was, it, we didn't think she was going to make it because she had a student in crisis. So, and we also have it set up so that if there's a crisis and school's not in session, the, the mental health centers has to provide service. That's part of the requirement. So, be glad to Many other questions? I'm going to answer, I have to ask a question in here, so Dale, you'll have to repeat it. Um, this is actually not because of another situation, but is the memorandum of understanding, is that, I mean, is that um, uh, we've done every year? Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. I need to repeat the question. Okay. Is a memorandum of understanding required each year? And the answer is yes, because you may have updated. You may have made to make change. There's a possibility that you might not change it. But if there's any changes, it has to be updated and signed each year. I'm just bringing that up because, because as we mentioned here about Senate Bill 367, and that was, I would say, a kind of a flaw that's in the legislation that uh, it's become a, that hasn't happened in school districts and with law enforcement um, across the state, district by district, and you know, for the memorandum of understanding that you're doing your new three. Yeah. And then each year, it's been done once and then you know, it's five years later and I uh, have a different superintendent and whatever. And so um, yeah, I think it's important that they are looked at every year. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you are correct. That was required for one year. Some uh, people involved in that, it was a part of the consortium. They're not excited about it. 
I mean, honestly, schools was not the issue. They and but right, they, they were, were they were told there's one of them said <laughs> I ain't got time to fool with that. I said I ain't been out to your school but twice in the last year, so why am I gonna fool with that? And so anyway, then a county there's a county attorney or two who said you can't do that. So anyway, that's that's another another issue. Are there further questions or comments? I think one of the things, Dale, that you didn't touch on was that the uh, de there is an online database that tracks each and every child through this process. As legislators, we don't see that information. But yeah, we we, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, we have a database. Each child is, is we don't use the term track because it's all confidential, but when they get ready to submit the report, the data is all there. It, and, and schools help set that up. It wasn't something we just up and dreamed up, but they it was it's simple, it's easy to do. And at the end of the semester, there's not a lot of work to do. Hit the button, and it, you're, it's it's there. So that is correct. And uh, we've got a lot of good input from the community mental health centers and the school liaison people. So it makes it a lot easier when a child does move, say from one district to another district, that this online database is able to keep track of them because yeah. they're also using their education number to track these children. Yeah, and see, and that's a good point. And see, they have a, an ID number. So the ID number goes with them. So that you are, you are correct, Senator, or no, representative, sorry, <laughs> Madam Chairman. Oh, I'll be, I'll be I'm not gonna say whether that's a promotion or demotion. Yeah, so. you just, oh, I'm calling <laughs> you. I can tell you that. <laughs> Okay, I believe yeah. Senator Petty has another question. Uh, Senator, <laughs> Senator Alley does. Do you want to repeat oh, the question? Senator Alley. Uh, they all are on the, page 29 on your chart, and it shows that uh, the improved behavior, uh, that improved, improved attendance and improved academics, the same student could be in each category. Is that correct? That's possible. Yeah, yeah. matter of fact, you kind of hope so. Yeah, yeah, you hope so. Yeah, the question, the question is, uh, the uh, you could have a stu one student in more than one area, like attendance, behavior, academics, and the answer is yes, they could be in all three categories, uh, and we'd hope th that's true. We want them to Im uh, improve in all three categories. Are there further questions? And I think, you know, Dale, as you mentioned this year, it's kind of like having a pilot within a pilot because of the expansion to allow uh, other uh, mental health services providers or substance abuse uh, providers to participate by working in conjunction with the community mental health centers because of the need for case management. Yeah, I, we think it's important that they work together on that to ensure there's 24 hour service, 24-7. Uh, so you are correct. We only had three that chose to do that this year. And uh, we was kind of surprised. Some we thought for sure it would because they kept, they, there was a lot of talk about it, but when they got come time to do it, they didn't do it. They didn't change, but we had three. And for some of the members that aren't familiar, as familiar with this program is it came about realizing that our school districts were providing services, but only during school hours. So you will find some of these uh, services are provided at the school building because the CMHC comes to the, the kids. And a lot of times those buildings are open till five, six, seven o'clock at night to serve not only the kids, but true wraparound services for the family members as well. Because you may find out that Johnny is, is stressing in class because mom or dad are having, you know, financial issues or whatever at home and, and could use some services. And then, then the CMHC is able to connect family to services that they may not know about that could possibly reduce that stress. So any yep. further questions or comments? Oh. Representative Ballard? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will follow up on this. Okay, so the category would be uh, children in need of care. And then we're looking at that second group. Are we still staying within those two groups? Although we may have- No, 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 it wouldn't have to be. Okay. That's the, that's the, the, that was the goal, but no, it could include all students. Some of the districts that jumped aboard on this rather quickly and it surprised you a little bit. Uh, 
I hate to say this, but it, it was the districts and they had suicide problems. Hmm. That was, there were several that joined because they was having mental health issues within their district. That, and that, so uh, they, they come aboard and, uh, and it's had an impact. Madam Chair, may I follow up on? If yes. they had, were they having suicide problems, did they not have pathologists in their district? Did they not have social workers in their school or were they just overwhelmed no. with too much to handle? No, no, no. It, it's no, it's smaller districts. Now the question is, why didn't they do this something earlier? These are smaller districts that didn't have that kind of support staff. They didn't have that available. But when this program come along, uh, there were several that jumped aboard because of that. They was very, they were very concerned and very worried about it. So, so. the other thing, Representative Ballard, is the uh, ability for you know school districts cannot bill. I still refer to it as S chip. I think it's just chip now. So the children's health insurance program, schools can't bill that, whereas a CMHC can. A CMHC then can also bill private insurance. And there's a, a very small padding that we put in there for the uninsured. So no child is ever denied services for the lack of payment. One of the things that people don't realize on our CMHCs, and if you notice today, CMHCs were referred a lot by each one of the agencies that talked to us. CMHCs have to take everyone, period. They're just like an ER at one of our hospitals. They cannot refuse you services. Right. So when Dale talks about the program originally started with the focus on foster care kids, which I appreciate the secretary's uh, ability this year to help us identify them quicker and also our high needs kids, but all kids have access to this program if they need. And I know in visiting some of the districts across the state, you know, listening to the liaisons, listening to the school staff and, and the principals talk about students becoming more aware of their surroundings and their friends. One of them told about a little boy that came to the office and say, hey, my friend Johnny won't come out of the bathroom. You know, maybe he would have, maybe he wouldn't have identified that that was a problem. We've even had some kids that come in and say, you know what, I think I need some help. So they're identifying themselves. It's, it's something that's kind of growing. In the, and we hope that when we hit about year five, we're going to start seeing a trend to where hopefully we have less adults needing long-term mental health systems because we addressed it early on. Well, one of the things, too, that we have not been very good at, we have adults, us, as looking at mental health as something that's an illness. We, we've not been very good at that as, as a society, but it's growing, it's getting better, particularly in our schools. And Madam Chairman, I don't, is Emily Henderson, is she on? I don't see her, does staff see okay, her? We, we had her all, she was gonna be here and, and kind of enlighten us, but a crisis came up with a kid. And uh, she, she said she, may not be able to make it. So anyway, I'd love to have her here because she's right on the fire line. Yes, one well, I looked on the sheet and it says that suicide is the number two uh, cause of death from like 10 year olds and all. What's number one? I can't answer that. Does anybody? I, I can't answer that. What's yeah, I thought I knew, but I don't know either because I was thinking it said it was number two. So I'm trying to think, what is number one? Because it says 10 to like 24, you know, or something like that. Hmm. Okay, we'll find out. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, and I know also Representative Ballard is that, you know, there's been some concern on, you know, how this program works and how it gets funded and stuff. But I tell you, there has not been a year that has not gone by since the pilot has been in place that a life, a child's life has been saved. It, it, if you talk to the school liaison people or mental health people, the number of students' lives saved is multiple. You can never say an exact number, but it's been, it's been numerous if you talk to them. Well then Madam Chair, I think that verifies what, you know, the pilot program was about, that there was a need 
And not only was it a need, but now you can see by people joining on because they needed it, they were not getting the services, they have it available to them. It, it needs to continue to grow for the sake of the kids. And for example, Wichita's on here and it's, it's, it's the biggest different state and they've got several buildings, but they, they've got uh, numerous buildings where it's, they're not in the program. The same is true for many other districts. It doesn't cover the whole district and all the buildings. But, and so, but it, it's, it's growing probably as rapidly as we can get social workers in the north. I had a call yesterday from Fort Hayes. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Fort Hayes has just got a program approved for uh, a master's level social worker and for Western Kansas, that's big. And I think in the program, undergraduate and graduate, they have over 200 students according to what they told me. And that, that's super. We had the same problem in Southeast Kansas, not enough social workers to go around. And so uh, Pittsburgh State, I think, has tried to help that cause. Well, and the, the, you know, as Dale touched on there, the workforce issue is huge in this area. And what we see happening in this is many times the CMHC will lose a social worker actually to a school district because of their involvement in this program, because the school has a need. And, you know, our schools were doing what they could with what they had, but they couldn't deal with these kids when a crisis occurred at midnight on Saturday night, because that's not how they were geared up. But they've also got teams. If there's a, a major issue at a school, the CMHCs are required to send a team out to that school and help address any issues that pop up on a larger scale than a one-on-one. -on -one. It's not unusual for a student to get in a, a crisis or a lack of a better term, a meltdown, to call the liaison or the mental health person in, of an evening, at night, sometime later. Other than this, the other thing that we didn't mention, probably we should, is that one of the big issues was we could help that student and not take them out of school. But if you have to take them out of school, take them someplace, bring them back, they're, they're right there to help the kid in school. So helping the kid in school was one of the big factors to, to not take away instructional time. Yeah, and that's been huge. Representing Ballard, we do have an answer to your question. The number one leading cause of death to children, 10 to 24, is distracted driving. Unintended injuries. I hate to yell, I'm just trying to decide. Unintended injuries, Madam Chair. Distracted driving. Oh, distracted driving. Okay. Is, that, is that kids or adults? That's 10 to 24. I'm just joking that's, about that. because That's 10 to 24, but I'm sure adults fit in there too. <laughs> <laughs> that, actually came okay. from, that, that actually came from Mr. Calvert, who's uh, part of KSDE okay. as well. Okay. You know what? That makes sense, though. Thank you. All right. Are there any further questions or comments with Dale? Madam Chairman, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for the time, and thank you for giving us the time to share with you a little bit about this. This is kind of exciting. You never know exactly how many lives you're saving, but you can see some effects in a positive way of academics, school attendance, behavior, and so forth. So thank you for letting us be here. I appreciate that. And I do have to share with legislators, the thing that's amazing is we've had um, money crossing five different budgets as we've done this, and a lot of different agencies involved, and there has been zero turf battle. Everybody has been uh, well vested in this and they've helped make it a big success. So thank you. Now we'll move on to our last item today, which is to kind of lay out a little bit committee of how we're going to move forward in this process. And I believe we're going to have uh, Carrie Bruffett uh, discussing, uh, discussing about the working groups and assisting us in this entire process, how it will move forward etc. I know that the non-legislators have heard a lot of information today and they're wondering, well, why is this all important? And I think you'll see that, you know, there's uh, one of the reasons we see a lot of fragmentation in your communities is because it's fragmented, you know, even amongst our budgets on a state level. And some of that has to do with how grants or federal funding come in with grants, etc. So, Terry, I'm turning it all over to you because you guys with Kansas Health Institute, you'll hear me refer to them as KHI, 
is uh, going to facilitate the working groups for us. So welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear me online okay? How about in the room? Okay. I'm a loud talker too, so that should help. I'll try without my mask on to not <laughs> project too much towards Representative Ballard. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk a little bit today. I think my assignment for this afternoon is to set up some homework for tomorrow, um, for some of our discussion tomorrow, the roundtable discussion, um, but also kind of walk through um, how we envision not just tomorrow, but the, the rest of the work of the committee and the working groups going um, for the rest of this fall. So um, as the as chair has discussed, as the legislature enacted, this committee has the special committee has legislative members, but there are also folks who are considered part of the round table and um, who are also joining via Zoom today. We see a lot of familiar faces there as well. Um, and part of the work of this, of the special committee will be informed by working groups. And um, it was envisioned in the, the language was passed by the legislature that there would be three working groups. Um, the working groups that, um, the way they've been framed to us have been um, talking about finance and sustainability. And when I think about what the kind of issues that that, that working group will take on, um, KLRD uh, outlined earlier the uh, crosswalk of some of the issues, uh, many of the issues that the previous working groups and committees and task forces have uh, provided recommendations. And they did a great job of, of grouping those together and then also trying to sort them out by main themes, basically. And, and then the idea is that these working groups will, um, will take on these themes. Um, so the, the finance and sustainability we thought about or in the draft form is that workforce issues, funding and accessibility issues and community engagement. And I, I think when we talked about it informally, we think of this working group finance and sustainability being focused on kind of what does the I don't want to say the pie because that makes it seem like it's a limited amount, but what is the picture of resources, both financial resources and human resources, um, both the models and potential forms of resources that are available for the behavioral health system as it is, exists today and the behavioral health system as it uh, might change based upon the work of the working groups and this committee and the legislature and the agencies that you've heard from today over the years and, and because part of the name is modernization and reform for the mental health system in Kansas. Um, another working group is policy and treatment. That working group is to be focused on prevention and education, treatment and recovery in special populations. Again, informally, we almost think of that as, is that the working group that's gonna look at the systems that are in place today? What can we do to help those systems operate more effectively and interact more effectively with people receiving services and with their communities? And then finally, the last of the three working groups is system capacity or will be systems capacity and transformation. And the kind of issues that were sorted there were data systems, interaction with the legal system and law enforcement um, and, and system transformation. And that included, for example, the inpatient capacity that Amy Campbell talked about earlier. And um, for that working group, again, informally, we think of that as what could the mental health and the behavioral health system in Kansas look like down the road? So not just how can we do what we do now effectively as a state more effectively, but what changes might be put in place to, to, um, to, to modernize the system and make it even better. Um, you heard a little bit today and they aren't, they aren't necessarily ideas that are re reflected in recommendations, but you heard some updates about um, the increasing use of telebehavioral health, for example. And that's something that um, we might think of as a potential way to help transform the system. It's a maybe it's a more effective way to do something we're doing today, but also to change the way um, services can be delivered and behavioral health is approached in Kansas. So, um, part of your homework for tonight and part of what we'll be discussing tomorrow is to look at that crosswalk that KLRD prepared and that you had a brief overview of earlier today and look at the kind of issues that have been sorted into these working groups and try to look for things that you heard about today or that you want to bring to the table or that will come up in tomorrow's roundtable discussion um, that, that you don't see there. What's not included yet? What do we think that needs to be added? 
Um, you know, we, do we need to have more information about the interaction with schools, for example? And is that something that you want to hear more from these working groups about as a special committee? Um, as well as, you know, COVID-19, the effects of COVID-19, how, what kind of things are, is that raising, um, are, are, are you seeing in your communities or have you heard about today or maybe tomorrow in the conversations that you want those working groups to reflect on? So the three working groups, the structure is going to be um, that those groups will meet probably about twice a month, starting in September, two times a month or, or every other week, I think is probably a better way to say it. Um, we'll try to keep KHIs working. We'll have, uh, we'll be facilitating those meetings virtually. So um, the intention is have, have those be like 90 minute meetings. So those aren't gonna be full day meetings, but we'll have, try to be very efficient in trying to get through a lot of work the working groups themselves, and we'll go over the charter in a little bit more detail tomorrow, um, but the working groups themselves will have a lot of um, you know, authority and say in how much time they want to spend on all those topics. But as you're thinking about these issues, also think about not just the kind of issues that you wanna see, if you're the legislative members that you wanna make sure are looked at by the, the um, working groups that will be supporting your work, but if you're a member of the round table or a legislator who may want to volunteer to be one of those working group, working group members, also think about which one do you think you could really contribute the most to? Which one do you think that, um, that um, you're most interested in seeing the most progress in? I mean, I, I know everybody's interested in everything, but if there's one that you think you're particularly well suited for, um, because part of our work tomorrow will again be trying to sort out the folks who are in the roundtable group, but the legislative members and the non-legislative members into these working groups. The charter, as we've talked about, sort of the draft charter for the working group, and we'll go over tomorrow, also would include other people of expertise that might be um, recommended by the working group or members of the roundtable, including, for example, um, state agency staff who may be invited to attend those working groups as well. So not expecting each of the agency secretaries, for example, to be on all three working groups, although you're certainly welcome to if you want to, but if you have staff members that you want to assign to each of those. So part of our work tomorrow will be also thinking through who is gonna serve on those. Um, and then as legislators too, uh, although it's voluntary membership and this isn't a subcommittee per se the, um, of the special committee, um, it is, I think we've seen in KHI's work with other task forces that legislative participation on working groups is really helpful in helping communicate back to the, the full special committee, the kind of discussions that were going on. And also it's helpful to have a voice of legislators in the room when people are thinking about these issues, because you know the legislative history, you might think about, hey, here's the kind of thing that we want to, that we've heard about before that might really resonate with this, with the legislature in our recommendations. So. Think about those as well. Um, the working groups, our intention, at, as we have done with other working groups that we've worked with at KHI, is to operate um, using consensus, so using a consensus-based um, decision-making. So the goal of the makeup of the working groups isn't to try to like somehow get a majority of people to try to get a five to four vote or something. We really want to try to um, facilitate towards um, towards consensus. So there's a strong, uh, strong voice and that the special committee knows that there's a strong recommendation that's coming from um, each of the working groups. And we've had, I, I think from what we've heard today from both the questions and what's been presented and knowing the history of many of, many of the folks, both on the round table and the legislature as well, who are interested in this. I, I think that um, is a, an effective way to work. And we've seen you all work in that way as well in many of your committees. So, um, we'll be reviewing, one of the things we'll ask working group members to do is really be active virtual um, members. So it can sometimes be difficult to stay engaged and especially if there's little technical hiccups or something like that with uh, being virtually in a virtual meeting. Uh, but we really, we have some best practices that we hope to try to be using to make sure that people can remain engaged and be active participants. Um, we will again have those meetings set up at least two times a month. We'll ask folks to review relevant reports and materials ahead of meetings. So we'll be sending out materials in advance. So that's another kind of request of folks who will be on the working group know that we'll hopefully have people um, 
having a chance to come into the meeting with, uh, with a common base of understanding about a few issues so we can really get down to the work of the, of the committees. Um, and let you know too that the working groups will be live streamed and that will allow for public viewing and, and of, of the discussion as well as relevant materials to the meeting. And those will be shared, the relevant materials will be shared not just with the members of the working groups, but with uh, the general public and with stakeholders. And again, each working group might set their own stake, their own ground rules and um, for collaboration as well. But tomorrow, this will be part of our discussion too. If you have other ideas or feedback for us about what you've seen that's worked effectively or recommendations you would have for us about how to effectively um, facilitate these working groups so that it can be, they can be as successful as possible in bringing you um, um, options that can get can be turned into recommendations for your report. So that's a couple pieces of homework. Um, another thing is, I think um, we'll start off tomorrow, if it's all right with the chair, um, that use some of the time to reflect a little bit on today. So as you've, if you go back um, to your offices or homes or wherever everybody's staying, who's here in Topeka, from not, from not here in Topeka, um, and think about what we talked, what you heard today, or maybe if you think of things you didn't hear today. I think we're really particularly interested in that as well. What didn't you hear that you would like the working groups to explore, or that you would like us to try to collect some more information about, um, for, um, for the committee's work as it moves down to its next committee meeting? Um, you know, think about the key themes and takeaways that you heard about today. And again, what was missing? What, do you, what would you really like to hear about um, or what do you not see represented on the crosswalk that you wanna make sure is considered by the, the working groups and are brought to you for consideration later. So that's part of what we'll be doing tomorrow. Um, the other thing we'll be doing is walking through and actually we'll do some breaking up and, or uh, potentially adding to this crosswalk of some of those other ideas. So if you have other subject matter that you wanna say, you want to make sure that a working group has a chance to look at and provide feedback on, we wanna get that added to the crosswalk so we know specifically which working group will be asked to do that work. So again, you get to read through this uh, crosswalk with a, in a little bit more detail and not only make sure that everything is where you think it ought to be, because we'll all have the opportunity to maybe shift things around if we think there's an issue that belongs in a, um, paired with some other issues in the crosswalk, for example, but also issues to add. So we'll spend a little bit of time tomorrow morning talking about that. Um, one of the things that we've found is really helpful when we are facilitating a, working with a working group that is reporting back to another body like a legislative committee is to understand the criteria, the prioritization criteria that the the body that's being reported to. So this committee I'm just gonna find important. So we'll spend a little bit of time tomorrow saying what kind of things do you wanna prioritize um, or how, what criteria do you want the working group to look at when, in terms of putting um, recommendations forward? Um, so we've used, and we'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, but some of it can be is, you know, level of resources or how, how much, how many people are impacted or perhaps how deep is the impact even if it's not a, huge number of people, but it could have a big impact on a smaller number of people. Um, so those kind of criteria, and we'll bring some examples for you to, to reflect on as well tomorrow. Um, I think of a few other things to help us get prepared for tomorrow. Again, we'll, we'll go through the crosswalk. We'll talk about the charter a little bit more and then try to spend some time when you're looking at the charter again, or the, excuse me, the crosswalk today to also think about which working group you'd be interested in. So there will be hopefully opportunity for volunteers. Um, if everybody just picks one working group to be on and we don't have anybody on the other two, we might ask folks to, to consider being on other working groups. I don't think that's gonna be a problem because I think from the people who are on the round table to the members of the legislative committee, I think there's both um, broad expertise, but there's also some really specialty expertise that will work very well in one of the three, um, uh, one of the three working groups. What's the three working groups? Yes, be happy to do that. So, 
and we'll spend a little bit more time tomorrow. And we can, um, I think at the end of today, we'll send out either by email, Dave, or by posting uh, the draft charter for the working groups. Yes, so you'll have that as well, but I'll go ahead and repeat that. Um, the three working groups are finance and sustainability. And if you look on the um, crosswalk, it's the work group one, it's, so it's the, it's actually on that document as well. And the, there's three big topics um, and groups of topics or buckets of topics uh, that are included for finance and sustainability. And that includes workforce, funding and accessibility and community engagement. And so some examples of the workforce, well, workforce is somewhat self-explanatory as an issue, I suppose, but an example of funding and accessibility was um, um, uh, allocating resources to prioritize areas of need. Uh, and actually some of these are recommendations we talked about today or exploring the waiver of the IMD, the Institution for um, Mental Disease Exclusion for Mental Health. Andy Brown talked about that. So um, that's an example of, of funding and accessibility. So funding and access kind of issue. Um, and then the other issue for that finance and sustainability work group or bucket of issues is community engagement. And that includes collaboration with other partners. So thinking of resources also including collaboration across sectors just heard about the collaboration with the Department of Education, for example. So that's, um, that's what that work group is focused on or would be focused on or proposed to be. That's based on your all's feedback as well. The second work group is policy and treatment and the buckets of issues that have uh, been sorted to them include prevention and education. We heard some good examples of that in the reports today. Um, also treatment and recovery so anything from expanding access and utilization of medication assisted treatment um, to um, the way that managed care organizations and can care interact with PRTFs. So you heard about the PRTFs in the update as well today. So those are the kind of things that fit within um, treatment and recovery. And then for policy and treatment, that group, there's also a category of sort of special, special populations um, which include children, but also veterans, other programs that are basically um, specifically designed for um, interaction with one population. So that is another bucket of issues that were sorted towards the, into the policy and treatment group. And then finally, the last of the working groups is system capacity and transformation. And um, data systems was one of those. And actually it's interesting, there's a, I think it, it um, several recommendations, and you heard about it today, about the interaction or the lack thereof sometimes of the data systems um, that are in the behavioral health system being potentially an obstacle. And that's actually been a recommendation that the mental health task force or a, something that was identified by the mental health task force and other task forces as well. Um, so effect, basically the effectiveness of data systems, but also the, the interaction or or availability of inter, um, interoperability of data to be able to understand the system is one of the buckets of issues. The other is interaction with the legal system and law enforcement. So that includes everything from, um, I think what Representative Bishop referred to before about uh, what happens to your Medicaid benefits when you're in a, perhaps in a correctional institution or in a county jail and getting, trying to get those reinstated um, to some of the way that youth, not just youth, but others are um, with behavioral health diagnoses might interact with the judicial system, the law enforcement. And then finally, systems transformations, which includes um, everything from comprehensive housing to um, integration of services to um, the licensing structure for certain kinds of facilities, and then the regional model for um, psychiatric inpatient beds. So that's the longer version of the <laughs> quick way I've run through it before. And I hopefully, and you'll get to spend a little bit more time in there. We won't expect to, we're not gonna be super process driven tomorrow because we also want to hear about issues that need to be added to this um, crosswalk. But if there's anything we, we just think, gosh, there's something we just sorted completely wrong. 
we want to know because we want to make sure we've got the, the issue sorted in a way that makes sense for those working groups to work together. Um, when you first started, you said of the legislation we passed last year, I can't find legislation that we passed last year. Whatever created the special committee. Well, I think that's the speaker. <clears throat> oh, that was more of LCC, not legislation. LCC. My apologies. Yeah, yeah. My apologies. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> I just I was trying to find that legislation and I, I only see stuff kind of 17, 18 and some 19 stuff and so okay. Yeah, my apologies, I misspoke. This question. This is more of a general question. How not nowhere in here, and we talked about this earlier and I've searched for it for a number of years, do we have measurements for outcomes and and how we're doing a good job, and if we're doing uh, adopting best practices, and if those best practices, in fact, are improving people's lives. Is that not, is this so vague, you know, health and that kind of stuff that we don't have any measurement? Okay, can you kind of repeat it? Because they can't. Do sure. It. Representative Carpenter was um, noting that he didn't see in the documents or in what was pre presented. Uh, um, discussion of sort of measurements of outcomes and, and whether what Kansas is doing or what might be recommended follows best practices and, and what we might expect to see in the outcomes if, if Kansas were or does. And um, I would say a couple things. One is if that is a, a, a very good discussion item for direction for a working group to say, hey, what would be useful in terms of what, what we want for as you're thinking about the recommendations is what are the things that we can measure? How can we, if, if it's a recommendation, is it related to a best practice? Um, is, that, is that something that this committee is gonna value to be able to say this recommendation is recognized and has good outcomes either in Kansas or in other states? So um, there are, and as, as we, we were discussing offline earlier, there are a lot of measurements around behavioral health. There are a lot, there's a lot of data um, sometimes it's the volume of data and, and the fact that the data, um, um, that there's not always that interactivity between different programs that I think doesn't, doesn't always do a good service to understanding the full behavioral health system. So if that's something that's important to the special committee, that could be something that the working groups take to and try to make sure that their recommendations back um, include that kind of content. Well, as I said earlier, we spent $579 million on mental health in Kansas. You can't tell me how many people we served, whether it's doing the job, or they're spending that money in the right direction. Um, and just that's been my question. I've struggled with that for a number of years. And, uh, I don't want to, I want to concentrate the money on where it will make the, the best outcome. And it's super hard to do that. So I probably ought to restate that. So represent, hopefully I'll do this correctly, but Representative Carpenter said, we want to make sure that the money that's being invested into the behavioral health system is producing outcomes. And we want to make sure we figure out how to measure that. Um, and it seems to me that that's one of the goals of, of the, that we see in the language here about the working groups. Um, and particularly the um, system capacity and transformation is uh, the fact that data and data systems has been sorted sort of into that bucket makes sense to me because um, it, it is a way to, it's a potentially a different way of trying to present the information that um, is gonna be in a strategic plan. As I understand from, and the chair can correct us, and I think that'll be part of our discussion tomorrow, that if part of the goal is to create sort of a long-term strategic plan, one of the key elements in a strategic plan is how are you going to measure success? How do you, what, what is the vision and how, what are the outcomes that are gonna help us measure whether that strategic plan is being achieved? And again, that data, that data systems bucket um, was sorted with that systems capacity and transformation, which includes the system transformation recommendations as well. And my apology about saying legislation. I've been used to, used to working on things that are on provisos. I almost said proviso several times, and so I tried to be too general. 
<laughs> instead was incorrect. Are there other further questions, comments with Carrie, whether it's the legislators or our non-legislative members? Boy, our non-legislators are kind of quiet out there. All right, Carrie, I, I appreciate what you provided oh. us here today. What? I think I see someone raising their finger. Oh, Don Jordan. Yeah, could I ask? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I don't have a copy of the document she was referring to. And if she could get, if someone could forward that out to us this evening to look over before tomorrow, it'd be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, the link in the web, the link sent earlier in the email didn't work. Did you get that staff? Yeah, I think they got it. They heard it's tomorrow. He said that it will be distributed uh, tomorrow or tonight over email. We'll have it posted to the website. And it'll be posted to the website. Some of this has been the learning curve of how to deal with this size of a group and when information can be released and when information has can you know should not be released. So we're all uh, trying to learn and, and I have to say that uh, staff has done an absolutely wonderful job uh, trying to put this together and make things happen. Today. Further questions or comments? And uh, David, do we want everyone to uh, be in contact with you if they have questions for this committee? How would you like to proceed forward? Not Dave Long, I'm talking to David Fye. I think, Carrie, we're done with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Dave Fye with Legislative Research. So I understand the committee is going to pick up on some of these topics tomorrow. So I'll go ahead and send out information after the meeting tonight uh, with a, a link for the testimony. Uh, it's also already posted to the committee page for the committee. Uh, the document that Carrie was talking about, we'll go ahead and make sure that is posted to the website as well. Uh, and I'll go ahead and I'll send an email copy of that out for members and stakeholders as well. So um, that should be helpful information coming there. And I'll also go ahead and uh, resend the link for the uh, entrance for the Zoom, the Zoom committee for the members and stakeholders. So you're able to uh, go ahead and check that link and access the meeting tomorrow. That'd be great because I don't know about others, but I was just searching through here trying to find some a Zoom meeting I have this afternoon and my email is on overload. So are there any further questions or comments or that anyone has on this today? Senator Preddy, did you? Uh, the, the chair had mentioned early on that you may want to repeat that, Dave. I couldn't hear. Sure. Uh, Senator Petty had a question about if the, the dates have been set for the meetings into the future uh, after the meeting tomorrow. We have, well, I don't think that we have, have we, Dave? So there have been tentative dates that have been reserved. Um, the first two dates were scheduled in 112, and we do have uh, dates set into the future as as placeholders to set those uh, to reserve the room for those meetings. So those those have been put into the out, long term calendar. Uh, so we do have the room reserved for those dates, but if needed, those could be changed if at the will of the chair. Okay, so we'll make sure that Senator Petty that we get that to you tomorrow. Uh, part of it depends upon how things progress with the working groups. And when they're you know able to bring things back to us, and then uh, the last, uh, keeping in mind, we have four more days after tomorrow that legislators are authorized to meet, and we want to make sure that two of those days on the end are for us to look at any potential um, legislation, recommendations to agencies, and of course uh, preparing the committee report. 
Mm -hmm. Senator Petty. I just I misunderstood initially. I thought those were those were set dates, and so now those are just placeholders. And so can I assume that maybe tomorrow we might be able to plan for um, the rest of our dates? Sure. And the question is from Senator Petty as far as if, if we can have final confirmation that the, the dates that have been set into the future for the committee, if those are going to be locked in uh, as the dates for the committee or, or if those are uh, potentially going to be changed. They could uh, potentially be changed. We have to see how things progress with the working groups. And I can guarantee you because I understand the issues with all of our schedules, the latter part of the year especially, that we will try to get those to you as soon as we can. It's not because we don't want to set them. It's just we've got to see how this progresses on the working group. I know I wrote down after the meeting, communication Thursday, August 27th, 28th, Friday, September 25th, Friday, October 30th, Thursday, December 10th, and Friday, December 11th. That was an email received about two weeks ago. I didn't that's that's the reply. tentative. I knew I had a chance. Me too. I could have seen that. That's the tentative date, Senator. Okay. I understand. Yep. No, we're all kind of in the same boat. Our calendars are kind of getting full right now. Any other comments? Any other advice for us, David? No more comments from me, Madam Chair. <laughs> all right. Again, I want to thank all of our legislators for participating today. And I want to thank every one of our non-legislative members that participated here via Zoom with us. We look forward to working with you. I'm just uh, thrilled with all of the expertise that we have on that committee. And people will notice that it does it has nothing to do with it, whether you're a, Rep a Republican or a Democrat, Don Jordan. <laughs> I had to throw that out to one of my favorite people, which is Don is that we have some really great people and some great knowledge on this uh, group to help provide us information. So with that committee, we are adjourned until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Barbara.